Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this formal council meeting. Our long-term plans are heard as part of our formal meetings, so it's actually the 525th meeting of Canterbury Regional Council, and we are specifically meeting to hear the long-term uh, plan submissions. So thank you very much to the members of the public um, citizens who are here today um, for taking the time to make a submission and especially for coming along to support your submission and speak to us today. I think it's absolutely excellent. It's democracy in process. So thank you so much. Um, the meeting is not being live streamed, but it is being recorded and the recordings will be made um, available on the website. Now, I would just like to ask Councillor Craig Pauling to give a nihi whakato and a karakia to open our meeting. So thank you very much, uh, Councillor Pauling. Aho mai o kaha, o mai wāroa ki a mātou i te neiwa. A ka huri au taku mihi, ka mihi ki nā aitua, ko e atu ki te pō haere, haere, haere tūra. Haere ki Hawaii ki nui, Hawaii ki roa, Hawaii ki pāma mau e nā mate, mai, 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 o ki o kuma. A apte hono tātou hono, toko mati ki toko mati, apte hono tātou hono, toko ora, nā kānui ora, ko a tāne mai nei, a tēnā koe. A tēnā koutou, e rarangi te rā māa, ko tāi mai nei, ki tēnei rā. Kei rangi te tūnui o tēnei whare o tātou, te whare o te kauni hera tāi o te waitā. Nau mai hara mai. Nau mai hara mai, wero mai, i tō whakāro, i tēnei māhere, o te kauni hera tāi o te waitā, a tēnā koutou. Ai, nā reira, e hoa māa, Nga manuheri, nga memo te hāpore, e noho nei, e mā takitaki nei. Ai, tēnei timi, kia koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. So just standing to follow Jenny and acknowledge everyone here, but also acknowledge some things bigger than us, the gods of our creation, our ancestors that have gone before us, and you people that have come to... Give us your challenges, give us your aspirations uh, for the long term plan. So, thank you very much for reiterating what Jenny said. And start with Karakia. Um, and thanks so much again. Ka kahaya tiata, ka hapara tiata, ka koro ki te manu, ka wariri te kutu, ko te ata nui, ka haraina, ka taki tu umere, he po, he po, he ao, ka wotea, a tihei, mauri o. Thank you, uh, Councillor Pauling. Um, just to carry on, the hearings will run over four days at the moment, and that will be uh, starting today, tomorrow, Tuesday the 4th of May and Wednesday the 5th of May. Um, you may like to know that all the submissions, the written submissions and all the, uh, all the submissions have been made available to all the councillors around the table. We will be reading all the submissions. And the ones that have been uh, heard today, uh, we've all read all of those too. So we'll just keep going through with our formal processes for a moment. Uh, I have to ask if there's any apologies uh, for the meeting today. I understand that we're just going to note uh, that Councillor Hands will be here in about 10 minutes. Uh, she's caught up with an appointment that she couldn't change. Um, but as far as I know, she's going to be hooked in as soon as she can. Um, conflicts of interest. Um, I'll say a little bit about that more in a moment, but I haven't been advised of any conflicts of interest. Um, hearings of submissions for the long-term plan. For this, we have an, a formal agenda and we have a report on our agenda. And it's all about uh, some technical processes around um, hearing our submissions. Uh, I've got a couple of resolutions that we'll move in a minute. But I just want to remind everybody at the council table uh, that there's two, there's the, that you can have a conflict of interest in these issues. They arise in two general ways. Where a member stands to benefit a pecuniary interest from a matter before council for consideration, whether personally or through connections with other individuals or businesses through which the member is involved. 
yes, a pecuniary interest. And the second way is where a member holds a bias or might be perceived to build a bias in relation to a matter that is before council for consideration. So I think um, if councillors could just remember that if you're involved in an organisation that's related to somebody who's making a submission, uh, you probably need to tell us about that. Following the, the submissions, the council will meet on the 20th of May to deliberate on the submissions. And on the 17th of June, we will be meeting to adopt the long-term plan. So I will just move from the chair that the council receives the report on submissions to the long-term plan and two, accepts late submissions to the long-term plan as listed in the report. So we've listed in here, uh, some people, it didn't quite get to us on Sunday night. Uh, I did get contacted over the weekend. Sometimes, you know, the machine doesn't work right or something happens. And it's seconded by councillor um, Peter Scott I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. There being nobody against, that's carried. Thank you very much. Okay, so we start commencing today with hearing of the submissions. At this particular hearing, for very special circumstances, Councillor Claire Mackay is able to listen online from her residence. Um, we tr everybody is um, hoping to be 100% present, but sometimes life intervenes because we are humans as well. So she's at home and she's online. Um, and so we have some submitters online too. And as you can see, you can see a photograph of um, Mr. Ted Howard. I'm sorry you have to be up there all this time, Ted. But if you're in the room, they can see you too, just not up here. Um, he's online and he's going to be our first submitter. So besides all the reports and the submissions being made available to us on a thing called SharePoint, which we can all look at, look at that, um, there's an update on, has been circulated to, um, to councillors as well, any updates. So staff have got us really well organised, so nobody has to worry about that. Um, we have all got also got a new submission for today, um, a, a submissions that I've added some last week to the hearing process, plus the full attachments of any that were missing from our schedule have now been provided by, for us by staff. And one was uh, submission 6880 from the Vice Chancellors of the, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Canterbury. So just getting back to how we're going to receive your message today, each person has 10 minutes. I'm sure you probably already know that. And then councillors can ask questions, mainly about clarification. There won't be any debate on submissions during the hearing. Uh, but as we said, the council will meet on the 21st of May to, to, to do those deliberations. If we do that, we won't have time to get through all the people who wanted to submit. Um, uh, Louise, who, who works up the front here with me, Louise is the council secretary and um, she has a bell and um, you will get the bell ring um, in the middle. When are you going to ring it, Louise? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. So if you hear that, don't worry. Oh, um, yeah, but we're not going to be long. You, know, you, you have to stop within about a minute and a bit, if you know what I mean. You don't have to stop suddenly. Um, so I think that's all I've got to say at the moment. So uh, yes, Councillor Pauling. I just wanted to raise up to move on Cranwell's apologies. Uh, he's had a time to Ah uh, yes, I'm sorry about that. I've missed out uh, Yayan Cranmore's. Um, he uh, Yayan is a Tumu Taya Mana Whenua expert. Uh, he normally sits there, but he's 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 absent but for another. Um, uh, as explained by Craig, he, no one else. I haven't missed anybody else, have I? All right. Um, right. Welcome. Uh, we'll start. Welcome, Ted. I hope you can hear and everything. I saw you waving out to me before, so um, we'll, we've, we've all read the submissions. So over to you to make some points to us. You can start now. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I appreciate uh, Just hang on a minute, Ted. I think we might need a bit more sound. Can, can everybody hear that? Um, so could we get a bit of technical support with the sound? Just, just hang on a minute. We'll try and get it fixed at yep. our end. Is it us? Who's the problem? Who, who's helping? I hope so. Uh, I, uh, who's going to help me? 
At ten minutes from. At ten. Last time you talked to me, we could hear you. So what's going on from your end? Do you need to turn the sound up or something? Um, that should be operating clearly. Hold on a second. Well, oh, hang on a minute. Sound settings. I'll see if I can get some other technical support. That's better. That was better, was it? That was better, was it? Yeah. Good. Okay. Ted, perhaps if you could hold your mic up to your, your mouth while you're speaking, it would help us. Okay, is that better? How's that, that is better. Well, Off you go. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, I appreciate you have a difficult task ahead of you. Um, this is a personal submission, not on behalf of any particular group. So today is Moahana Day. So 215 years ago, in 1806, Mapui chief Moahana discovered the island of England for the Maori and met with the local rangatira, George III. What we see, what we experience, is often defined by some combination of our past experience, our current context, our attitudes, our values, and our stories. Modern science is clear beyond any shadow of reasonable doubt that reality is more complex and fundamentally uncertain than any computational entity can deal with in detail. So all models we make of it, all experience we have of it, are necessarily simplifications, and as such, necessarily wrong in some aspects. And if we're lucky, they're useful and reliable in most sets of contexts. So 46 years ago, I was riding my XL 250 motorcycle around the Waikato from Tekuiti to Thames, using the oxygen probe in my backpack to measure oxygen levels in rivers, streams, and lakes. Many of the streams had no oxygen in them. Many businesses discharged their waste directly into waterways. We've come a long way from those days. We've made a lot of progress. Rivers and streams are generally a lot cleaner and people are generally much more aware. Though in many towns, people still put their green waste on stream banks. And the more we push systems, the more conscious we need to become. And here in Canterbury, recent changes in farming practice are creating issues for groundwater in particular, which are difficult. So modern health and safety systems now accept that it is the practitioners at the sharp ends, the ones out there doing it, who are the experts. And it is their choices that make a real difference to safety outcomes. Modern health and safety systems are about empowering people to make appropriate choices, not about having bits of paper. We need to accept that farming is more complex than any set of rules can ever encapsulate. And we need to be educating and supporting those doing lawn maintenance, farming and industrial work to make choices that support the quality of water that is essential to all life. Models and rules may look good on paper, but are unlikely to be really effective in reality. Reality is just too complex. So if you look at the latest stock exclusion regulations as an example, when you read the title in the context, which reads exclusion of stock from lakes and wide rivers, then it sounds reasonable. But then you look at the detail and a wide river is, designed, is defined as any flow of water that anywhere on the property is wider than one meter, meter at its greatest flow. For many low-lying farms, that is essentially most of their farms. And when it seriously rains, water flows across most of the surface. The other aspect of creating such exclusion zones is who manages the weeds and pests. Reality is often much more complex with more consequences than our simple models expect. My key message is that we will only make a real difference to the many levels of very real issues that we have if we encourage and reward responsible action at all levels. Some level of law is required to deal with those who are genuinely cheating, and many of the current laws are such that they discourage responsible action as they are so broad that whatever one does, it is going to break some law. So there's essentially a random chance of punishment with no real reward for real responsible behavior and no security for any. 
So I encourage you to continue doing what you have, to work with the willing, to encourage the reluctant, and only an extremist to punish the recalcitrant. And one final quick message of support for generating wider consensus on environmental issues and supporting groups like Te Korowai and Braid, and then supporting action for, for the native plants and animals in our threatened systems, particularly our ground nesting birds like the kaki, the ribel, the banded dotrel, and our titi, the hut and shearwater. Cats, rats, stoats, ferrets, pigs, hedgehogs are all predators that these birds have no natural defense against. So thank you for your time and consideration. I appreciate the many levels of difficulty you face and I wish you well in your deliberations. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Ted, for that submission. Uh, is there any councillors that wish to um, ask a question of clarification from Ted? Councillor Lan Farm. Kia ora, Ted. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to clarify from your submission because um, when it first talks about which of the proposed options you'd like to see us progress with, uh, it has other option, and then you talk quite a bit what you've just talked to today. Um, but then later, when it talks about whether the option one is affordable, um, you've got option one you think is affordable. And I'm, I'm noting, you know, from your comments that this is a much more complex response than, you know, we have in this long-term plan. So. Are you saying generally you're encouraging us to have a change of framework or are you saying you believe we're on the right track and you think expenditure in these areas like climate change, like biodiversity is one way to achieve what you're trying to say here? Or are you just saying it's complex and needs a whole framework change? Look, part of it is, yes, it's complex. It needs there does need to be a framework change. Like our current economic system in and of its own internal incentive structure cannot deal with these problems. They are of a different order of complexity. So we cannot rely on the market to solve some of these complex issues. We need to have fundamentally cooperative responses and that requires of every one of us that we exercise responsibility to the best of our limited and fallible abilities. So I'm, I'm encouraging you to continue educating. I'm warning ag against being too hard on people with regulation, which I, I can tell you that most of the farmers I know think that these regulations on um, on farming, on uh, stock exclusion, they're just completely unworkable. Whoever wrote them has no experience of either water or farms. Um, they just can't work. It, it, it essentially makes everyone um, breaking the rules. And that's not good. It, there needs to be respect for the rules and there needs to be ex respect for getting the outcomes we all need. So, Insofar as ECAN has been encouraging responsibility, I urge you to continue down that road. But I'm very scared about the level of rules and the number of people who are urging people to be strict about rules because that can't work. It must fail thank, and we need it you, to Ted. work. Thank you, Ted. Uh, we have one more question for you uh, from Vicky, Councillor Vicky Southworth. So thank you for that, Ted. I noticed in your submission, you talk, you used to say that you can afford the rate rise under option one, but for many that are less fortunate, that could be a struggle. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can identify who, who you specifically think of in your community when you make that comment, and also if you have any suggestion for us as to how we can make this more affordable. That's, that's a really hard question because what I see happening in our economic system is that automated systems are decreasing the utility of labor. So incomes generally are going down and that trend will increase. So it's, 
we need some sort of system that is something like a universal income to counter that. If we had a universal income, then this would be affordable for the less fortunate, for those that are on lower incomes. But right now, any increase in costs and any increase in rates shows up as an increase in rents at some point. And so, like, for me, I own my own house. I'm essentially independent. It doesn't bother me one way or the other what you do. It's tiny. But that's not the case for most people. I uh, thank you very much, uh, Ted. I don't think we've got any other questions, so thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome to stay online and listen in. In fact, I hope you do. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a good day. Bye. Uh, now I would like to move on to the second submitter and ask um, Wendy Harris to come to the table. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, just to, uh, while you're getting ready, I just want to uh, re, um, restate that we have all read your submissions. So uh, any main points you can make or however you want to present it, that will be good with us. So thank you very much for coming in today. Over to you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, as you said, I'm Wendy Harris and this is Nolene Francis. Um, and we're here representing the Silverstream um, Volunteers Group. So I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background about our group and what we're doing. Um, so the reserve is located in Waimakariri district, um, southwest of Kaiapoi. Uh, it's uh, two pieces of land, um, basically, that run alongside the Silver Stream, which gives it its name. And the group have been operating for about 15 years. Um, we have uh, a good number of volunteers who come at different times. Um, there are organised meetings every Tuesday and Sunday, and people turn up as and when they can. Some people like uh, Nolene here are very dedicated and come every Tuesday and every Thursday, uh, Sunday I should say, um, and then other people like myself turn up when we can, which is about every two to three weeks from me, but we have enough people that we have a, a good group uh, most days to turn up and, and do some work at the reserve. Um, we also uh, have good links with other groups in the community. Um, we have uh, the student army comes along sometimes to help. Um, some of the local schools come and help and other groups come along and we have, um, they give us some help with the work we do and we provide a bit of training and that sort of thing. Um, we also have links with uh, local businesses as well. Uh, there's a local contracting company who come and help us. Uh, they bring some of the heavy machinery down and mulch up um, branches and so on for us at times, um, on a regular basis actually, and then we spread the mulch around um, the new plantings that we're putting in. Um, so as a group, we're quite well established and we, um, we operate quite well. We're quite self-sustaining at the moment. Um, and some of the things that we're asking for in our submission are actually more um, technical assistance. Um, so there's a couple of things here. We're looking, um, we'd like to get an ecological assessment, a comprehensive assessment done of the reserve. We know there are some rare and threatened species in the reserve, and we uh, have had some advice to about how to manage those parts of the reserve to help those particular species. But there may be other things there that we're unaware of, and um, so we just we may even be doing things that, that harm those species just unwittingly. So we'd really like to know what is there so that we can help those um, species the best we can. Um, now, we've submitted on the Waimakariri District Council LTP as well, and we've put in the same request to them. Um, we know that their um, in-house ecologist can do most of the work, although we know they're able to, they haven't actually agreed that they're going to yet. Um, so the bit of it that we're asking you for is, um, I'm hoping that you have a, a lizard expert on your staff because um, the person at Waimakariri doesn't have that particular skill. Um, so we'd really like somebody to come in and do a lizard survey for us and perhaps give us some advice about how to manage any lizard species that we find, um, so to help any of those kind of species. Um, and along the same lines, in terms of technical advice, there's an area in the reserve called the Fen, which is a low-lying area, um, has some wetland ecology and so on. And we're wanting to do some restoration work there. We haven't really done a lot there to date. Um, we don't really know that much about what to do with the area. We kind of keep the weeds down and, and keep it under control like that. But um, again, uh, some technical expertise and advice um, to get us started about what to do would be great. Um, and then we're quite capable. We, we can run with that. We have some 
I guess, amateur ecologists on the in the group um, who would could take that advice and then really um, help us as a group to go from there. We just need a bit of a, a push in the right direction, basically. Um, so that would be really useful as well. The last thing that we're asking for is to do with access. Now, the reserve is in two parts. There's an east and a western part, um, and they're separated by a piece of crown land. Uh, and there's a salmon fishery on that piece of crown land. Um, and it used to be administered, or the, the reserve used to be administered by um, Niwa, um, but it has passed to dock now. Uh, we'd really like to get access through that. It's a very popular area for walking, both the east and the west parts, and it would be great to get a link through. Um, and now that DOC are managing that Crown land, uh, we think it's a good time to approach them because DOC obviously have their own objectives around providing for public access, which we think this will align really nicely with. Um, so um, again, we've put this request into um, Waimakariri District Council as well. Uh, and I think it probably needs one of the councils to take the lead, but having support for both councils for that access, I think would, um, would really help push the case for it. Um, so those are the three things that we were asking for. Um, happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. I'm glad to hear we've, you've put them in to um, Climacarui Council as well. Um, so we've got two questions, I think, one or maybe three. One from Councillor, no, you don't want, you've had yours answered. Councillor um, Grant Edge and then Councillor Van Farm. Thanks, Wendy and Nolene, and it uh, sounds like uh, a really amazing work that you're doing on the reserve. I just wanted to ask, are you aware of the Zone Committee, um, the joint ECAN Waimakariri Zone Committee, and the work that they're doing on a project called Clean and Green Silver Stream, which actually aims to um, coordinate uh, a larger project, uh, almost linking uh, Kaiapoi along the river uh, through that reserve, um, and I just wondered if it would be useful for you to um, contact them and, uh, on, you know, in terms of uh, a joint working party, but they've been working on that for quite a, a number of years, um, jointly with the District Council. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it would be useful, I suspect, for you to uh, align with those for that group. Um, yeah, we were aware that, I think some time ago, um, possibly 20 years or so ago, there was a uh, a push to try and get a link right along the stream from Kaiapoi. Um, and I think there were just difficulties with negotiating with different landowners and so on, but I wasn't aware that um, that it had started as a, is it an active group now? It, it's, a, it's a project um, through the Zone Committee and um, it's been uh, managed by our area zone manager and uh, they've been doing that for quite a while. So I'm not sure, sure which stage it's at at the moment, but it's certainly an active project that's been pursued. Uh, just, um, yeah, we'll just stop there, uh, Grant, at the moment, thanks. So we'll we'll take that on board. So thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Lampa. Sorry, mine was actually in a similar vein, um, congratulating you on the collaborative way you've brought this initiative forward. Um, but. Yeah, I, I was also going to flag the zone committee as a way that there would be regular and staff involvement and something that you could really develop over time. The zone committee is also open for um, new members currently, if you're interested. All right, so we'll be putting you in touch with them through the staff. Thank you very much. Uh, this is just questions, councillors. Um, Councillor Ian McKenzie. Well, so mine is just a question, uh, uh, apart from congratulating you on your efforts, but uh, have you approached DOC yet about access to the Crown land? So, so you, you have no position as to what there. Cool. Well, I just want to say thank you very much, and I'll just let you know I don't think this is a conflict of interest, but I spent New Year's Day with my wider family and some young children in the reserve. It was fantastic because hardly anyone else was there, but it was a huge brown trout, and it just looked so clear and lovely, and I, I, I thought the farmings were going very well. So thank you both very much for coming in. Um, we'll just get you to pop this um the mic on the speaker on when you get up there, please. Uh, 
Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, so, my name is James Nicotine. This is my colleague Peter Wells, who from the Blue Cradle Foundation. Um, so, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Mont Blanc te manga, um, ko Lake Léman te awa, um, no French Alps ahau, ko Nicotine tongu, whānau, ko James toku ingoa, um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Good afternoon. My name is James Nicotin. I'm from the French Alps and Geneva in Switzerland. I moved here two years ago with my family as a recipient of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. I'm an interdisciplinary marine scientist, filmmaker, and consultant with several international multilateral organizations, nonprofit foundations, and UN agencies. I am French British citizen. I'm a master of marine science and um, I've worked and consulted globally with the International Union for Conservation of Nature, several UN agencies, including the Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, the International Seabed Authority, and the United Nations Environment Program. I'm passionate about the ocean and I'm most at home when I'm in the ocean, snorkeling, diving, or in a submersible. Last year during the lockdown, from my observations of the situation here, I decided to start an ocean social enterprise and nonprofit. Blue Cradle and the Blue Cradle Foundation aim to make ocean science more accessible and provide a platform for marine science, education, and interdisciplinary marine research in Canterbury and beyond. Based between the Southern Ocean and the South Pacific Islands, Blue Cradle is in an ideal geographical position here in Canterbury to work collaboratively to understand the implications of a warming planet and ocean facing biodiversity collapse and pollution of all sorts. Now, Canterbury is perhaps not most well known for its marine environment, but in fact, it has 800 kilometers of rugged coastline stretching north of Kaikoura at Kekerengu Point to the Waitaki River. This represents 11,620 square kilometers of ocean. It includes the ocean space above a large continental shelf, a deep sea canyon, many river mouths, estuaries, and three main currents carrying nutrients to support a rich and varied diversity of marine flora and fauna. It is incredibly varied with long sandy beaches, gravel beaches, rocky shores, mud flats, and the rugged coastline of volcanic banks peninsula with caves, small islands, and marine habitats. At Blue Cradle, we applied ourselves and wrote ground applications and filled the space with a collaborative ocean agenda and, and, and ocean literacy education on our agenda. Our first project actually came to us. And since August, we've been virtually with no funding working on a white flippered penguin survey all around Banks Peninsula using GIS technology and led by ecotourism company Pohatu Penguins. Um, using a citizen science model and working with over 60 volunteers with the support of local hapu and multiple agencies, including ECAN and the Rata Foundation, we engage the community through educational uh, events and the production of a documentary, Corolla, which is currently in cinemas. In June, our second project will use a research vessel in Auckland and we'll look at microplastics and biosecurity. Our planet is 71% covered by the ocean. It regulates our climate and through the water cycle, oceanic circulation and the oceanic biological pump. 90% um, of the excess heat caused by anthropogenic um, greenhouse gases has been absorbed by the ocean. The constancy of these contributions and capacities has its limits. Over 80% of the ocean area experienced at least one marine heat wave and tipping points are becoming more apparent with negative impacts on marine biodiversity and ecosystem services. Anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are the chief cause of the oceans accelerating and harmful rates of deoxygenation, warming and acidification. We need to reduce our carbon emissions and we still need to draw down the excess carbon in the atmosphere and the ocean. One way of doing that is to protect and rewild a large portion of the planet. Fully protected areas deliver benefits ecologically, but also socially and economically. Um, many countries around the world have rallied behind a 30 by 30 call to protect 30% of the world's ocean by 2030. And this will be decided at the CBD meeting in China later this year. Ultimately, Southern Ocean Protection and the High Seas BBNJ framework can help us get there. In Canterbury, Safeguarding the ocean's health calls for greater efforts to minimize negative impact effects on land-based human activities, in particular discharges and emissions. The IPCC Special Report on the Ocean and the Cryosphere 
specifically highlights fragmented governance systems as a key challenge to addressing climate change risks. And it is clear that adopting a mountain to sea or ki uta ki tai approach will help this fragmentation. Microplastics, industrial waste, and excess nutrients from agriculture, fertilizer and pesticide runoffs, and sewage carried to the sea and rivers and drainage systems degrade coastal ecosystems, further compromising the ocean of climate services. We need much better monitoring systems downstream to inform our management approaches upstream. This ki uta ki tai approach to management is mentioned in the 10-year plan, but needs to reinforce the oceanic component and building capacity in our marine environment to then collaborate between upstream and downstream actors. So in the context of the 10-year plan hearing, I would like to make three key points. We request that ECAN, through its 10-year plan, dedicates a lot more energy and funds to the development of a marine environment and biodiversity portfolio or an ocean plan. In our view, the current and overdue coastal plan needs to go much further and be one piece of a much larger puzzle, incorporating marine spatial planning, area-based management tools for protection of marine ecosystems and biodiversity. And despite falling under different institutions, ECAN can still lead this process and work across scientific institutions, government actors, and nonprofits. Secondly, ECAN has a lack of capacity for data collection in the marine environment, and that is actually one of our goals. Blue Cradle aims to deploy instruments from a research vessel permanently based here, acting as a sentinel ship capable of monitoring the coastal environment and the pelagic oceanic space for temperature, acidity, and conducting bathymetric surveys and fish counts and biogeochemical analysis. With a dedicated vessel with state-of-the-art scientific equipment and the best scientists here, we believe Canterbury deserves to have its own capacity and understanding its waters. Finally, we ask that ECAN acknowledges the fact that we've entered the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and that it must engage in ocean literacy education, mainly through its activities and working alongside community and scientific actors. It is not too late, and UNESCO Commission in New Zealand is now welcoming submissions for projects to include uh, for international significance. The last coastal plan was 2005 and was republished in 2020. Back then already, a lot had been identified to support the understanding and management of the coastal areas, but crucially, the work done previously does not seem to have looked at marine biodiversity, in particular seabirds, seals, penguins, and have a robust understanding of the biogeochemical climate-related changes. We can make decisions and implement nature-based solutions um, as they are a critical element in building the resilience of ecosystem societies and the economy uh, following the 2030 Agenda, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water. The only mention of the marine environment in the 10-year plan is on page 21, mentioning uh, managing the coastal environment. It seems really like an anecdote, and it needs to be uh, more acknowledged um, as it seems not to even take account of the, uh, of the pelagic area beyond the coastline. Ultimately, the Blue Cradle Foundation is hopeful that by hearing us today, ECAN will get the message to work on this and increase its focus on the issues. Finally, we encourage ECAN councillors to turn to Tangata Fenua to find appropriate solutions to manage, protect, and restore the marine environment. Across Papatipu, Runanga, and Tikanga, there are a lot of management frameworks, including in the context of Kaitia Kitanga and Kiuta Kitai, that can be useful to implement monitoring and restoration plans. These include Maitai Tais, Tayapures, and Rahui, use of the lunar calendar, and locally managed marine areas. Blue Cradle believes in working together to create an integrated approach in respect of the Tiriti or Waitangi principles of partnership, participation, and protection. The 10-year plan is called It's in Our Hands. Blue, Blue Cradle's motto is perhaps a coincidence, is the ocean is in our hands. So thank you for your attention. Tena koto katoa. Thank you very much, James. Um, have we got a question from a councillor? Councillor Craig Pauling. Hi, tena koto James. Tene uh, tene kia pēmoto. Thanks uh, for your submission. Um, I have a question about, um, you mentioned three things for us, um, sort of the ocean planning side of it, um, the capacity around sort of marine biodiversity, and then the, um, the UN funding. Um, 
if there was one thing you could choose, out of, I know this is tough, but it's all equally too, but if there's one thing you had to choose out of those three, what would be the most important to you? Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Councillor Bolling. Um, for me, I, I, for me, the first one is probably the the most important: the the, the investing the oceanic space uh, beyond the coastal margin and actually having a plan uh, which resembles uh, a marine spatial plan, which could incorporate different uh, analyses uh, and and also collecting the data that's already there, that's already done by NIWA, by LINS, by DOC. And just coming together with a, a a strategy, and then the rest can come after. That's my my recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Vicky Southwest. And thank thank you for your presentation. That's really interesting. Um, I was interested. You talked about the need to understand our land actions that then impact on our coastal and ocean environments. And I'm just wondering. It sounds like you've had a, quite a lot of a look at the data that we already have. It sounds like you've, you've been working, albeit voluntary or unfunded. Are you able to give a sense of the sort of amount of money or the level of data, extra data collection that's needed to inform, well inform a coastal plan in order that when we're talking about notification by 2024, so sort of like understanding those time frames and that cost, is that something that you've got a handle on or is that or would that need more work in itself? Uh, thank you um, for your question. Uh, for me, the, it's difficult to know what the budget allocated to the coastal plan is. And, and based on that, I would be unable to respond to that question because I don't know how much uh, is being spent on that and how much would need to be uh, comprehensively spent on the rest. So it's, it's a difficult question. But I know that there's a lot that's been done already, funded by different um, CRIs and, and, and projects at a, at a more national level. Uh, it needs a, a reshuffling. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, James. Oh, sorry, there's one more question. Councillor Ian McKenzie. Uh, thank you for your submission, James. Are you proposing through Cradle uh, work with ECAN in terms of developing these addendums to our coastal plan? Uh, thank you for your comment question. Uh, sure, that's something that we can certainly help with, um, establishing a road plan and bringing in crucially the, the right uh, people in the room, because that's probably the first thing to do. Thank you very much, and thank you for spending your time coming here today. We really appreciate it. So have a good rest of the day. Thanks very much. All right, we're on to... Um, the next submitter will be Nick Lego. Did I see Nick there? Oh, there you are. Yes. Thank you, Nick. Um, just um, need to turn our speaker on. Mike. Tanakota Katua. My name is Nick Ledyard, and I'm submitting on graded rivers, particularly the environmental and um, conservation element, the indigenous ecosystems that are there. I do that as chair of the Ashirakahuri River Care Group and also as chair of BRAID, Graded River Aid which is an umbrella group in the interest of all the rivers in Canterbury. Um, I don't need to stress to you how important braided rivers are in the Canterbury landscape. They're iconic for the, for the Canterbury landscape. I don't think that people realise when they drive south, like I do, say, from Rangiora, my home, through to Timaru, the only bits that I passed that were there 200 years ago above ground are the braided rivers. It's away from the coast, away from the mountains. Um, in those braided rivers, we still have elements of our indigenous ecosystem hanging on, and the most important, the most obvious part is, is the the birds. And this is time why every time I drive south, my good wife, as we approach the river, says, "Now, Nicholas, you keep your bloody eyes on the road, because we're about to cross a river, and you're not allowed to look up and down." But um, unfortunately, we've Unfortunately, in the past, we've tended to mine our braided rivers. We've mined them for shingle, for gravel. We've mined them for recreation. We've mined them for water. And the end result is that indigenous ecosystem that I'm talking about is even more threatened than it was. Management to date by the likes of ECAN has been to protect us all from flooding. And I thoroughly agree that's number one objective. But unfortunately, it's been done with a rather blanket approach, which has ignored those um, biodiversity and 
conservation environmental values. On the Ashwakaluru River, for instance, such management has meant we've lost 50% of our good traded river bird habitat on that river since the middle of the last century. And main reason being the berms have advanced at the expense of the fairway. And that basic question of how much berm do you need to protect a stock bank, to my mind, has never been adequately answered. On top of that, we're still extracting gravel and we know in places that has been excessive. You do you provide consents for that, and some of those consents they have good criteria in them. The criteria could certainly be improved. Unfortunately, they're not being enforced. One of the requirements is that the people on the river, when they leave it, it should be left in good habitat when they leave. That is not occurring, even now. And I point that out as I think it's an area where we've definitely got to improve. Your long-term plan has a lot of very good words in it. I like the bit in your biodiversity and biosecurity section, which talks about creating landscape scale alignments with agencies and communities to revive these rivers, which are key to their future and the life and activities they sustain. We could say that we, could say that we as you are the Rakuri River Care Group, are one of those communities. I also like in the water and land section uh, how monitoring and understanding our environment and collecting and monitoring good quality trusted data that can be accessed and used by the community and reported on to see whether you're actually attaining those um, statutory requirements and environmental outcomes. The previous speaker talked about good data. You must have good data. I show you data that we have collected with the River Care Group. Don't need to look at that in detail. But that's for 20 years, where we see the bird numbers rising and then falling about here. That, that exception there, we want to talk about that. Now they just didn't find. That's the sort of stuff you've got to have your finger on the pulse if you're going to manage these things properly. And to be honest with you, it hasn't happened on most of the greater rivers, particularly on the plains element. So the long-term plan has very good words in it. And I don't like to call them platitudes. That's because they've occurred in the past and we're not seeing the results. We just have to see more action on the river. So in conclusion, where we work, the Ashirapahui River uh, in the lower section is owned by ECAN. If it wasn't for ECAN, we probably wouldn't be in existence. In 1999, one of your officers, now retired, Rob Gerard, was instrumental in setting us up and getting us going. And such partnerships need such attention to get them going. A lot of people talk about partnership with great pride. If you don't look after them, they'll disappear. They have to do more there. And consequent to the work that we've done in not 2018, we were, we were awarded the Practical Management Award by the Australasian Wildlife Management Society. That's Australasian. It's always good to get one over the Aussies. So we're very, very thankful to ECAN for that support. But what I've just said is things are not right. They're still not being acted upon adequately. And your long-term plan has to not only say what's needed, but actually go about implementing them to make sure that those outcomes you desire are reached. Nami. Thank you very much, um, um, Nick. And um, thank you for working in partnership with us for all that time. It's certainly a powerful grouping that you've got in your riverbed. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie first. Um, so this is just a question of clarity. Um, so what you're sort of asking for is uh, more investment in staff and partnerships with, say, universities and that to to collect more uh, reliable data over a long a long time period. You're saying at the moment we're not we're not doing enough of that. Is that but I'm not saying that you necessarily need more staff. You've got excellent staff on board. One problem with eCanada is with any big institution, often the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So they need to work together more, like your practical operational engineering side needs to work together more with your management side, your decision making side. And what I just showed you there, that was collected by a great group of volunteers. Whereas you employ professionals 
So I'm not saying you necessarily need more time. I just feel that you need to set in your long-term plan goals and in terms of acquiring data which will actually tell you whether you're reaching your outcomes that you want. may not need more staff, just needs direction. Thank you, Nick. Um, Councillor um, Grant Edge. Thanks, Nick. Just a, a question of clarification, really. I just wanted to confirm, are you um, supporting the idea of the Braided River Revival Scheme um, in terms of what you're talking about now? Um, yes, one. Yeah. Yes, definitely. One of the sections I read was out of that Braided River Revival Plan, and I will, will most definitely be following the outcomes from that and whether those uh, goals that you have set are being achieved. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nicole Marshall, did you have no? Councillor uh, Ian McKenzie. Uh, th th thanks, Nick. I was, I was interested in your bird survey data, and, and you're encouraging us to have more data. Is there a correlation between uh, what you've suggested as poor river management in terms of flood control and and bird population data? And and, and if there is, uh, presumably some of this um, better information could be collected between existing staff, as you already suggested, and the likes of your your group who are collecting that, you know, the citizen science that's collecting that bird population data. Um, yes, the you, you, you do bird surveys. I mean, I'm very aware of those. I've partaken in, in many of them. But that information, that data needs to be brought together and presented in such a way that um, we can see the results and, and adapt accordingly. The riverbed management that you talked about, the biggest challenge on Braided River at the moment, Braided Rivers at the moment, is weeds, particularly on the foothills fed rivers rather than the alpine fed, fed rivers, which can get major floods. So it's weeds. And um, this, this year, for example, ECAN is going to assist us, and I hope you record that, because I hope they do, in clearing between 60 and 70 hectares on the Ashirapalu River, because we cannot rely on floods in those foothill fed rivers. Um, and also, we do very much, and the engineers are aware of this now, we very much need to put more priority on maintaining that open fairway grade area. At the moment, we've just been besotted of protecting ourselves from floods, and we, I don't think we really know what we answer that question, is how much do you need to sacrifice the river to protect stop banks and protect floods? All right, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? No, I think that's all the questions, um, uh, Nick. So thanks very much for all the work your group's doing and thanks very much for coming in and presenting today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, person will uh, be uh, Victoria Andrew. Hello, Victoria. Uh, come and have a seat at the table and we'll just have to put your microphone on. Uh, I'm Victoria Andrews from the Aquaro Civic Trust, and I'd like to introduce Mike Norris. Uh, he'll be presenting the submission, but I'll be presenting a very brief PowerPoint because we wanted to give you a visual idea of what happens or has been happening uh, and some of the problems caused by mass tourism. Uh, in recent years, we've been quite happy to have a reprieve, uh, but we know it, that will not last for much longer. Um, and we'd like to thank you for the opportunity of addressing you today in person. So just very quickly, there are a number of competing users for the Aparoa Harbor, which we regard as part of our cultural heritage. Uh, the Civic Trust has been in operation for over 50 years now. We focus basically on the built environment, but equally as important is the surrounding environment, inclusive of the harbor, which we regard as a real treasure. Yeah. 
sorry, it doesn't seem to be. Okay. Um, the wharf, as you may be aware, is administered jointly by the council and by ECAN, and it's really become the focus of activity since the earthquakes from 2011 to the point of being so busy that members of the public and other users are sometimes excluded. And quite often with the large cruise ships that we had over the course of about nine, 10 years, there'd be a, a large degree of seabed disturbance. That's not moving. We could need a little bit of assistance um, for that. <laughs> Natalie, thanks. Oh, we got it. We can't rely on amateur photographs. Uh, we can't rely on cell phones. We really need professional detailed information to gauge the degree of disturbance. So again, these are just a few images that people around the harbor have sent to us. And we think that there has to be a professional assessment undertaken, but we also know there has to be adequate funding and we think that should come from the cruise industry. And air quality is a real problem too. Um, and that has had no monitoring. Uh, it also has the impact and effect not only on the people around the harbor, but also on the ecosystem of the harbor. And back in 2018, I happened to witness an, an accident, so I made a report. And the next day, ECAN was on the wharf. And since that happened, uh, things have improved with ECAN's oversight. So um, things have been improving. Uh, unlike activities such as this early on back in 2013, with ECAN's presence, this is a rarity, thankfully. Um, but large cruise ships with all the passengers congest the wharf and the congestion goes all through the town. And we just feel like there have been policies and regulations that have been brought into effect by the Harbor Master, who's been very, very good to work with. But you need to continue monitoring and enforcement once the cruise industry starts up again. And I think that our Pacific Trust is of the view that the fees should also be increased substantially to underwrite some of the expenses. And this is what it looks like on a busy day. Uh, vendors set up their tours at the end of the wharf. Uh, 40 to 50 buses come over to pick up passengers. They go into Christchurch and then come back to Akaro. So that's four return trips a day. And it causes a lot of congestion, not only in the harbor, but also in the town. Uh, and we just dodged the bullet with COVID-19 when the Golden Princess came in on the 15th of March. Um, and we have had other ships that come into the harbor that have had norovirus just charging passengers into the town. So that's something that we're totally uh, ill prepared for. And I know it's not an ECAN responsibility, but it is something that we face. And lastly, uh, as we acknowledge the closed borders have allowed us time to kind of regroup and regage. And all these reports are coming out. I mean, Stuart Nash, the Minister of Tourism, has written reports. We met with uh, Simon Upton, EDS came out with an excellent report. And we just really would urge you and the council to get together and talk to the community and talk to the various users about how to monitor and handle the situation should it reoccur and when the borders start to open. And we need that to be done in a very positive and impartial professional manner. So thank you for your time and I'll turn it over to Mike Norris. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the chair of the Akron Pacific Trust. And I would like to thank ECAN for making this opportunity available to us. It's actually the first time that the Akaros Trust has made a submission to the environment Canterbury. We've made plenty to the Christchurch City Council on this particular topic of cruise ships. But it seems that ECAN has been quite quietly watching cruise ship activity. And it wasn't until 
on the eve of our AGM a couple of years ago when Andrew Turner, the deputy mayor, was coming, that one of our residents in Akira, having studied a bit of um, marine law, um, tried to serve a summons on the master of one of the princess ships in Wellington, saying that if he came into the Akira heads and disturbed our seabed by more than five cubic meters, he'd be arrested and the, uh, he could face jail time or could be fined. After that, we had two frantic calls from the chief of ECAN, and um, things were sorted out temporarily. But we think the timing is right, because ECAN appears to be stiffening its enforcement of the coastal plan, and it, it's well overdue. Um, the Christchurch City Council, by contrast, which has responsibility for the type of uh, chaos that um, emerges uh, on a double cruise ship day, uh, don't seem to be able to grasp that um, more is not better. And I hope they will be reading Simon Upton's submission that we have to reimagine tourism. I make it clear, the civic class is certainly not anti-cruise ship. We're a body promoting uh, Akira as a destination uh, because of its virtues, but we are against mass tourism and the strain it places on our resources. So where ECAN comes into the equation, is that we want more regulation, particularly of cruise ships and the number that can come in a season, and certainly no double days. Um, those pictures that you see up on the screen, uh, they're not lying. Uh, in, 19, in 2019, we had 92 cruise ships in the whole season, some of them on back-to-back -back days, some of them lunatically um, scheduled to be uh, two on the same day, and back to back. There was massive seabed disturbance, but it seemed that nobody was very worried about that. Uh, you can see in the previous pictures that Victoria showed that uh, there was an enormous amount of seabed disturbance. And of course, they sit there all day with their bow thrusters on, belching out um, smoke. We don't know whether they're using the correct fuel. I know they've signed up to Arcol, the, the new protocol for clear, clean fuel. Up till then, only Milford Sound had bothered to say, well, we won't let you in unless you're using clear film. But, Bill, but we don't know because we're not in a position to monitor. And we urge ECAN to step up its monitoring. Now you've got the financial resources to do so. The American government are well into this. I will quote you a letter from the Department of Congress um, Transportation Department to the chief executive of Carnival Cruises, and they're the biggest in the world. They own Princess, United. And he wrote, <clears throat> cruise ships are a fertile breeding ground for infectious diseases due to their environmental conditions and physical structure. While cruises are often viewed as a carefree escape from reality, where passengers can dine, dance, relax and mingle, we would hope that the reality of the COVID pandemic will place a renewed emphasis on public health and passenger safety. But frankly, that's not been seen up to this point. In fact, it seems as though Carnival Corporation and its portfolio of nine cruise lines, which represent 109 cruise ships, is still trying to sell the cruise line fantasy and ignoring the public health threat posed by the coronavirus to future potential passengers. Now, that's the same line that was fined over $60 million in the years leading up to 2019 by a court in Miami. And when Carnival came up in front of her last time, she said, uh, because they, they pleaded that they were not going to do this again. And she said, well, you said that last time you're here. So next time you're in front of me, I'm thinking about jail time. So we urge ECAN to stiffen your um, enforcement of the powers that you have. We in uh, 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 we're not a port, so we're not subject to the same regulation as, say, Lisbon or Sydney would be. The, the decision on how many ships to allow seems to be an amalgam of ECAN and, Bar uh, and Christchurch City Council and Christchurch New Zealand. So the undesirability of cheap budget passengers coming in means that the, 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 the economic contribution of cruise ship passengers is actually marginal. They don't stay for dinner in the evening. They don't stay overnight. On the more budget class uh, voyages, they will at best have a coffee and uh, maybe a snack at the cafe. I see Stuart Nash in his lengthy review hasn't mentioned cruise ships, he's mentioned freedom campers. 
You're going to hear from another of our colleagues later on who represents the Ratepayers Association, and he will also urge you to act as forcefully as you possibly can to protect what we have in Akaba with the powers that you have. Thank you. There'll be a question from Councillor Ian McKenzie. Just look, th thank you. For, uh, I'm very familiar with Akara and, and, and some of the concerns you raised. Um, I guess my question is, uh, is your objection both of for mass tourism from a terrestrial point of view as well as a seaborne point of view, or is it specifically towards seaborne? So if, for example, when international tourist trade opens up again, should it ever open up again, and let's say the cruise ships go into Littleton, would you still be objecting to, you know, uh, 200 buses driving from Littleton and tobacco Road for the day? I mean, the, 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 so just to get clarity on, you know, which are, the, which are the most important issues? Is it what's happening in the harbour or what, what the harbour then transfers back onto land? Well, thank you, Councillor. The, the answer is, is both, because the, the, um, the activity on the sea is one thing, um, but the congestion in the town is another. And if Littleton-based uh, ships then send busloads of tourists back into Akarala over a road at Gabby Pass that's really not suitable for uh, massive bus traffic, and they don't regulate where they're going to park in Akarala, uh, we suggest that the plan should be for them to have them slightly out of town and then shuttle them in. We're going to have exactly the same complaints. If you can't uh, have traffic moving down a very narrow main street with all the buses trying to park there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor um, McKean, uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you. Does each ship cause the same amount of disturbance of sediment? No, it doesn't. And a lot of it is weather driven. If they're fighting a um, southwesterly uh, and they're trying to get the tenders alongside in the lee of the ship, they have to use their bow thrusters and they're what's caused the stirring up. It was a beautiful, calm day. You're not going to see quite the same level of disturbance from the seabed. Well, thank you very much. But um, that's the end of the questions, I think. But thank you so much for taking the time to come over today. We really appreciate it. It's really good to get locals' perspective on what is happening over there. And we really appreciated the slideshow as well as your words. So th thank you very much for allowing us both to submit. to the table, um, Cheryl um, De La Ray from the University of Canterbury, if you'd like to come up. Oh, and Robin Nuttall, you've got Robin with you as well, have you? And um, Igna Veer, come to the table, please. Be lovely. We'll just get you to pop your mic on when you're ready. Ready. Welcome to start. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Cheryl De La Rey aho, tu mu whakarai, te wharuananga o Waitaha. Uh, my colleagues are with me. They'll introduce themselves uh, when they speak. Firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity. And by a, I think a coincidence, the University of Canterbury and the ECAN plans overlap for a significant period of time. So we have a plan from 2020 to 2030, with yours being very closely aligned chronologically. I want to firstly say I really welcome the emphasis in the plan on partnerships and cooperation. Uh, but I would like to urge that there's more purposeful thought and intent behind the cooperation with the tertiary sector. I don't aim to speak for the entire tertiary sector, but I certainly like to speak for the University of Canterbury. In our 10-year strategy, we put at the heart of a strategy the concept of engagement, and that speaks to our commitment to serving public good. Uh, in the year 2023, we will be celebrating 150 years of our institution. And I mention that because it suggests to me that uh, 
we as a university, and I'd like to ask you to also consider us as an anchor institution in the history and development of the Canterbury region, uh, contributing right from the very beginning. And if we go back to the founding vision of the region, education and particularly tertiary had, had a significant role to play. Uh, universities or the tertiary sector, but particularly from my perspective, are inherently future focused. We're always looking at the future and that starts with the contribution we make to developing the leadership and the professional skills for the future of the region and the country. Uh, just to give you some example of that, very recently uh, we've introduced some new qualifications ranging from micro-credentials to uh, speak to the growing demand for professional development, right through to new undergraduate degrees, for example, in data science, which I think is really important to the planning initiative and for monitoring how plans are implemented so that uh, rather than in retrospect uh, saying, well, we got that wrong, that one can in almost real time monitor the implementation of a plan and self-correct along, along the way. So the first contribution is definitely how we uh, contribute to uh, the skills needed in the region at various levels. The second one is the knowledge and expertise that sits within any tertiary institution. And we've given in our sub written submission some examples of the expertise at the University of Canterbury. Uh, there's always been good co co collaboration and cooperation, but I think we have an opportunity to think more purposefully about how we do this, because much of our cooperation over the decades has been, I would say, ad hoc, re relying on one in individual in the university with other teams and individuals. But from my perspective, I would like to, to really speak as strongly as I can that we should come together at an institutional level uh, because by working together with our respective areas of expertise, I believe we can produce a lot more without spending more of the public resources that are always under pressure. And expertise, we have wide ranging and not only human expertise in the form of our academic expertise, but also the, the uh, capital investment we continue to make. For example, uh, our GIS uh, expertise would be very useful in the planning domain uh, and in the modeling that we do. Uh, for example, two of our academics from mathematical modeling have made a significant contribution to our national response to COVID. That modeling expertise could be very useful uh, once again, as we think about the next decade of regional development. The third area that I'd like to suggest uh, we have an opportunity to, to work on is looking at our contribution as an institution to the local economy. Uh, we are a significant employer in the region. We procure goods and services on a significant level. And as part of our new strategy and our commitment to engagement, we have set ourselves a target of, for local procurement uh, across uh, our goods and services. But we also plan the long-term future of the institution. We have a major investment plan. And as we plan new capital, for example, a matter on our agenda at the moment is thinking about the future of our Dovedale campus we would like to work in a more coordinated way with our public institutions to think about our long-term future and expanding the contribution we make to our local and regional communities. The final uh, example I'd like to give is in terms of our commitment to this concept of engagement, we began a discussion uh, here initially in Christchurch, but now more broadly ac across the Canterbury region, about a knowledge commons, which has already been set up. We are working with the key public organisations here, and my colleague, uh, Associate Professor E. Ken Beer, is leading that. But how we can pool our expertise, and very importantly, in an ethical 
in a responsive way, bringing our respective databases to bear uh, in our thinking about long-term planning. Um, I think we must acknowledge that in a world that's becoming more challenging and complex, no one institution is able to respond to all of these challenges. But if we work together in a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional, but in a very purposeful in a way that is, I suppose, mutually beneficial, we can really make progress. And the final example I'd like to give um, is with respect to our partnership with Manafenua Naitau. The University of Canterbury is the uh, host of the Naitau Research Centre. Uh, led by uh, Professor Tamari Tao, who is also Upoko for Naturiri, and the work we're doing in key areas through the Naitao Research Centre, for example, on water and many other major projects, I think is a real opportunity that uh, if we're much more purposeful, we can le leverage a greater benefit for the good of our communities. If there's time, I'll ask my colleagues to elaborate. Thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. That was um, a great presentation, if I might say so myself. Uh, first question will be Councillor Lan Farm. Kia ora, Cheryl. Thank you so much for that, and thanks for coming with such a thoughtful and, I think, necessary mm -hmm. approach. Um, I just wanted to question a bit more about what the, the sort of an increased partnership might look like. and. Is this something like maybe like a formal MOU or is it more like a governance to governance regular meeting where we canvas types of things? Have you any ideas in that? Well, I think the MOU will be an expression of uh, the intended partnership, but it can be simply left to paper <laughs> uh, unless we um, are, act, are really active. I use the word purposeful and intentional. I think a governance to governance uh, periodic get together would be entirely appropriate uh, because it's also about how we choose to focus our resources. So we all under resource pressure, but in any one budgetary cycle, we make choices about what to prioritize and what not to prioritize. So for example, we have a small internal budget that goes for scholarships uh, to fund work integrated learning for our students, and it goes for major research projects in the university. If we had a governance to governance or leadership to leadership uh, arrangement, we can meet and think about what your priorities might be, where it overlaps with ours, and that will shape our resource allocation. Uh, just to give you one example, whereas if it's an MOU and a kind of loose cooperation, we will miss out on that opportunity. That's a word, purposeful. Oh, I like that word. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Phil Clearwater. Thank you very much, Cheryl. <clears throat> That's um, very timely uh, comments and submission we've made by people. So I just want to ask you about perhaps some nuts and bolts aspects like, for example, and just to let you know, like, for example, recently and possibly a wee bit too late, I hope not too late, we recently had Professor Susan Cumbrick come and talk to us. And I just wondered if there might be other ways that perhaps um, uh, academics with expertise in particular areas might be able to perhaps be advisors alongside our staff to some of the new committees that we're setting up. That's the first question. And the other thing specifically I wanted to is could we actually just, besides having an, over, an overall plan, make sure that we include um, at this, um, at Eek Environment Canterbury, potential for some really good placements and internships for um, young students. Uh, I'm delighted to hear uh, that question or that point. Yes, and I, what I would like to urge is the suggested governance to governance uh, meetings or joined up planning, if I could call it that way, because it, for example, for my office, I was aware of what the priorities are for expertise. We would then give that person allocated time and recognize them for their contribution rather than that just leaving it ad hoc. So Ikan sitting alongside me has been seconded out of his teaching 
for a period of time to set up the Knowledge Commons here in, in Christchurch. And we would do something similar to recognize the contribution that our academics would be making as advisors or in other ways. Similarly, with, with placement of students, uh, as um, I think we're all aware of, the, the obligations on organizations are, are significant, the health and safety responsibilities we have. Uh, and if we coordinate that effort, uh, our students would benefit but I think it would um, simply spread the responsibility, but without taking each other's respective roles, we would demarcate what our roles are. We would respond by placing students in areas where they need it. You would have an opportunity to give us feedback, and very importantly, where there are skills gaps. Universities often get criticized for uh, producing graduates that are not quite ready for uh, the needs of the day. And by working together in this way, it will help us think about our curriculum, its relevance, the quality of the graduates, and whether they are in fact uh, the quality with the skills that you require. Were there any further questions? Well, that um, seems excellent. Thank you very much. And but, um, I want to just say thank you for taking the time to come. And that was very purposeful that you've come and you had a pre-meeting with us during our consultation period. So thank you very much. And um, uh, we'll, be, we'll be in touch. So thank you. Kia ora koutou, nami nui. And we have copies of our strategy if anybody would like one. Sorry, just to add to what Cheryl has said, Kia ora we know that the university is a complex and large place to work with and sometimes you will have direct replacements or people that you work with if at any point you don't know who to go to luckily you can go to Cheryl apparently I was going to offer my services uh, I've got a very weird name and easy to google so feel free and we'll put you in touch because as much as we are an engineering and science university we are a complete comprehensive university so there might be a social science perspective or business perspective that will be able to be useful so please do come and have Oh, Thank you um, to the to the Encore um, Institution of Canterbury, one of the Encores. Thank you very much. Bye. So the next person who's going to come to the table is Keith Townsend. Thank you, Keith. And you'll just have to press your button so your speaker comes on. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Keith Townsend. I'm a um, <clears throat> fourth generation farmer. I've spent uh, two thirds of my life up north in East Waikato. I've spent 25 years here in, um, in Canterbury. And um, I just thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak on behalf and give you a rural perspective of what I see coming and um, how we can avert the problems that I do see. I've, um, my main concern, of course, is for the rural people, is the rates hike that we are facing. And I don't think many people here would realise exactly what it is until I do my rates comparison, which I do off the website. And for those who can't see that, the rates on our property um, under option one will increase 90%. Under option two, it will increase 82%. Now let me put that in perspective in terms of monetary. Our current rates bill is uh, around $30,000. We have a number of properties that is going to go to $55,000. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to put swap place where you are now in whatever position that you've got, whether you live in town or whatever, and you're facing a 90% hike in your rates bill, or maybe 82, we don't know. How would you feel? 
as a raw person, I feel pretty gutted, really, that I've got to come here and try and stand up for the people of this land. So I'm in the Ashburton District Council, and that's the race bill for there. We've got another property in on the peninsula. That's not so bad. The rates there in the Akara got by 20%. Why is the difference? Why is there a difference between Christchurch City Council, Ashburton District Council, of like nearly 70% in rates? The rural sector is fighting to stay alive. So you as ECAN representatives are here to represent the good of the people. We're here for a long, on a long-term basis to do the best we can for this area and for the, the burden to fall upon the rural sector, such as what is trying on this comparison, is, is just hard for me to believe that you would even think of doing that. So I'm here today because I oppose this rate drive. I think it's just totally out of the question. You know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, I remember Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern praising the, the rural, praising the, 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 the primary industry sector. She was saying they're going to be the salvation of our nation, that they're going to get us out of this trouble. Of course, with our tourism industry going down the tubes, our number one industry is our prime industry. So if you're going to stab the primary industry in the back, where is the country going to go? You know, we've got dairy, we've got meat, we've got wool, we've got horticulture, we've got forestry. We've got all these very important industries that are keeping us afloat. And so I want to be a part of keeping it afloat. I don't want to be going down with other people. You know, there's businesses going broke everywhere. There's jobs being lost. And it's interesting that some people think you can just keep on pushing a business as far as you like. Unfortunately, you can't because we all know here that if a business doesn't make a profit, you don't have a business. So if you don't have a business, you don't employ people. If you don't employ people, there is no livelihood for anyone. The rural sector must stay buoyant, buoyant to ride out this pandemic. And this is, this is really making it impossible. If I've got a $25,000 rate increase, how am I going to budget for that? How I can control the costs of my inputs, my fertiliser, my sprays. I can control things, but you cannot control your rates. You know, in Canterbury, we've spent a lot of money over the years and I mean I'm, I'm from up north and, and I come down here and I think well these farms down here they're, they're just pristine they are so good you look at the countryside I put people coming to me and saying this country looks so good it's so well looked after and I think what people forget is that us raw people we're generational right next door to where I live I've got a there's a farm been in the family for five generations. What do those people want to do? Do you think they want to go? Of course they don't. We're a generation. We love what we do. We love the land. And yet there's this great urban-rural divide that the farmers are ruining the land. Far from it. It is not that at all. We love what we do. We love the land. We're not there to ruin the land. It's like having a business and running over it with your, your big machine and ruining it. We don't want to do that. We're there to protect our land. So in Canterbury, under the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, under the Land and Water Regional Plan, we've set in place rules that are equal to the, the essential freshwater plan. And as Ted said on that screen up there, most of these rules are unworkable. They are not possible. They are made impossible for us. Do you think if someone gives you a set of rules and in that set of rules, there are rules that are absolutely impossible, what do you think? Think, oh, this guy's a nut. 
where you think, oh, well, we'll have, have to work our way around it. We can't work our way around it. You only work your way around a, a, a world that is just impossible, it's not even rational. And as Ted said, there are people in Wellington that they don't even know what they're talking about. The farmers know how to organise their own farms, how to make them workable. We don't need someone in Wellington to tell us what to do. But anyway, just getting back under the water management strategy, the land and water regional plan, these rules are equal to those for the essential fresh water. We've invested 55 to 60 million central government needs, needs to be made aware of what's happened in Canterbury, what's been done. We are way, way ahead of every other regional council in this country. And I think we can be very proud of that and you as councillors can be proud of it as well. But what we need to do is we need to push back on what central government are trying to do under the central freshwater plan and say, look, we've already done this. We don't need another $40 million to change the name. The rules are already in place. And so that's what I would like to see. There's no benefit by spending another 40 million if we've already got them in place. So please push back against central government because we don't need them. We've already got them there. The funding, the funding for the for the rates. Um, I mean, I'm a pretty grassroots person. Um, what I think we need to do, number one, we need to remove from um, for environment schools. We don't need to teach environment schools. The Ministry of Education can do that. We don't need youth engagement. The university can, can do that sort of work. Climate change, more fear-based and emotionally driven. We can't be spending lots and lots of funds on these things that we really are not tangible and we don't know if we're going to get a reward from. And as a ratepayer and as councillors, we need to work together to be able to get the best result for everyone. So as a rural sector, we're, we're being targeted and unfairly burdened. Now, why should we, as a rural person, be increased with a 90% increase in our rates when people in Christchurch City are maybe 5%? I don't know, what, I don't even know exactly what the figures are. But it's just it's just not it's not fair. We've been singled out for compliance increases. Our new our irrigation rates are going up to two dollars fifty two hundred and fifty dollars per site now to get monitored. Essential freshwater legislation is being targeted as rural. Why are we being targeted all the time? What do I propose? I propose number one maximum increase of 8%, which is in line with other years. Why do I propose that? Because we're okay with a rise, but we're not okay with a 24% rise, and I'm certainly not okay with a 90% rise, and I'm certain that none of you would be happy with a 90% rise in your rates either. The UAGC is currently at a rate of $22 per household, I understand. The recommended increase was to be $144. I understand that the Selwyn District Council, Huanui and both in Ashburton are all in favour of an increase to $144, $144 a household. Okay, I've said let's go somewhere a bit down and let's say $110 a household. If that was the case, at least there's going to be a bit of even spread of the rates, not all to the rural sector. But the third thing I propose, no capital borrowing, borrowing to fund rates. Capital, the libraries, swimming pools, capital items, that's fine. But for anyone here who's run a business, you know you don't borrow capital to run your business. So you do not borrow capital to run your business. What would I like to see? The social, the social impact on what's happening in the rural sector is so great that it is creating real angst amongst 
rural people, farmers, people who love being where they are. We feel we're being attacked. The overall divide, I was hoping was men, but it doesn't seem to be. We seem to be attacked more. I'd like to see the, the rural urban work together. As happens in Australia, if you're familiar with Australia, they love the farmers. I'd like to see common sense prevail, basically. Yeah. That's all I ask for. And I don't want to make it feel like it's impossible to work around this, but I'd like to put it out. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to come in. That We really appreciate it for your perspective. Is there any questions in the room? Kathleen Park. Yeah, thank you, Keith, for that very um, clear submission. Um, I guess coming back to the sums that you mentioned, um, just digging a bit more into affordability for you personally, because you'll be aware that generally we operate on this rationale that those who can pay more, um, do you feel the increase in rates will threaten the viability of your business? Coupled with all the other uh, compliance um, expenses we've got coming in, it definitely will. Yes, it's. I mean, that's a big amount on top of what we already have, and I don't mind user pays. We pretty much have been user pays for a long time, but it's when we're targeted for all, all the extras. I mean, we know very, very well that we are being levied for the, the stormwater that's happening in Christchurch. That's where this is coming from. And why? Why would that be? I don't know. We're quite happy with user pays. Um, I, I, I think this is a, a huge noose around our neck that we've got to try and deal with. Yes. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Clearwater. Uh, Thank you, Keith. Um, can, I, can you um, are not happy with option one or option two? I understand that clearly. So I just wondered, though, to help us to perhaps get to where you'd like us to get. What, what say in a what would it be an option two if you were in our position that you would cut out? Well, I can't really answer that because I don't know how this is made up. I don't know. I don't know where the funds have come from to get to the rural sector. Where's it, where, where's it been drawn from to get from the 24% to us, where ours is 90%? What are we actually paying for? That we don't know about. Because as I said, we don't mind paying for what we use. But where's it all coming from? Why is it lumbered to the rules? An example, I guess, the fishing for reforms. But are, are you suggesting that we not, that we take that up? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm just wondering are there any specific kind of areas that you believe that we could uh, reduce in their spending or cut about? Well, I have already put a few of those in, in terms of environment, schools, youth engagement, climate change. Option one, but I'm not good option two. Right, well, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. I just noticed something when you held up your thing, um, and I noticed that there's actually not much of an increase in your general rates, but there's a huge increase in your targeted rates, and those are normally in your local area, so something like the managed aquifer recharge project or something like that. Um, so flood protection. Yeah, flood protection. Well, thank you uh, very much. Yeah, so I'll just explain that what we'll do is we'll follow up in writing for you around that and give you the explanation for those particular uh, rates along the outline that Councillor McKenzie is saying. But we'll be following that up with you. So we, ha we haven't got time to discuss all that today. But we really appreciate that. Did anybody else over here have a question? All right, well, thanks very much for coming in. It, it was great. It's good to hear your personal example. So thank you. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to welcome to the table uh, Joshua. You might give me a lesson in how actually to pronounce your name because I'm I, I'm not certain. So I'm 
most people are aware that, unfortunately, um, often people who have a mental illness live in a lower socioeconomic area. And those are some of the areas where, in fact, the previous council did take out the services. So I'm just wondering if, if um, Environment Canterbury could do it with other councils, would you like to perhaps see uh, an increase in the coverage of our transport and public transport system? Uh, maybe as a, just a general comment first, is it would be great if you could have a mental health and wellbeing lens across all your work. And that's what our communities need all local government to do, to make the four wellbeings actually meaningful. And then I suppose the second part, yes, if, if we can increase the social connectedness of people who have lived experience of mental health challenges and addictions, we ultimately are more well as a, as a community. So I agree with you, if that's your, if you're suggesting your perspective. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I want to sincerely thank you for coming in um, and thank you for raising mental health because you're right, it's very important to everyone in our community. So have a good day and thanks for your time. Okay, bye. Um, the next person to come to the table is Mark Alexander. Welcome to the table, Mark. Just pop your, the speaker on if you don't mind. Thank you. Good afternoon, councillors. I'm here today as a resident of the Solomon District in an environment Canterbury rate park, regardless of any other roles that you know me from. <laughs> when I say we and our, I mean it in the larger sense of myself, my family, my community, the greater Christchurch community and environment Canterbury. I feel a bit hard pressed with such great speakers who, who went before me. But I'd like to first of all congratulate you and your council on the role you fulfil in regional leadership and all that entails. You actually do a great job of bringing the territorial authorities together and getting a common purpose. Sometimes in the smaller TLAs, we feel that a certain larger TLA is a bully and needs a mediator to get uh, some fairness. And you fill that role very well, so thank you. I'm also genuine when I congratulate you on the boldness of your LTP of our LTP, not your LTP, but our LTP. And I'm actually here to ask for a rate increase. Probably one of the few people you'll hear over your hearings that comes and asks for an increase. I'm gonna focus on public transport. We need a vibrant, successful, well patronised public transport system to help us achieve our climate change goals. I'm sure we can agree on this. I'm gonna start with a couple of brickbats. Abandoning the coloured routes and the coloured buses in favour of a mediocre, nearly invisible teal colour scheme does not enhance nor promote the services. Many like me, and I'm visually disabled, do not find the teal colour, the terrible teal colour, helpful. It's hard to distinguish amongst other traffic and nearly impossible to recognise at any distance the bus one needs to catch. If I stood on Rickerton Road, I could see my yellow line bus a very long way away. I cannot identify which teal bus is mine until it's virtually on top of me. This is not an enhancement to the services. This does not enhance one's perception or enjoyment of the PT network. And I'm not alone in that. I've talked to other Selwyn residents, particularly the older residents, and they say exactly the same. The teal buses are a dreadful colour. You cannot see the teal bus or the white route board at anywhere near the same distance. We were meant to have a fee review last year. It didn't happen probably COVID's fault, nevertheless, it didn't happen. For Selwyn residents, the current fair structure does not encourage people to use PT to get to Christchurch. The two-zone fare and the time travel leads to many decide that it's cheaper, easier and quicker to drive than catch the bus. Going to a single fare zone would greatly enhance the perception of PT system as a viable transport option. It's one zone, Templeton to Sumner, Two zones, Rolston to Templeton. Two zones, Prebleton to Lincoln. It's absurd. I asked for an increase in Selwyn's PT targeted rate to fund the reduction in fees. I think we'd also see an, an increase in patronage. And it would reduce the number of private vehicle trips from Selwyn to Christchurch. And similarly from Waimakariri to Christchurch. So I'm not suggesting that Selwyn residents pay for Christchurch, but for Waimakariri PT fees. As you know, and possibly Councillor Sunkel 
may remind you, Selwyn is the fastest or second fastest growing district in New Zealand. At present, Selwyn District Council is processing plan changes that could lead to 4,000 more sections in Ralston alone. And yet our PT planning and provision and service delivery isn't growing at the same rate, not nearly the same rate. We are literally missing the bus. It isn't good enough to put PT services into large subdivisions year after the residents have arrived. By that time, we've habitualised the residents into using their private motor vehicles. Once that's happened, it's much, much harder to get them out of their cars and back onto a bus. We need to provide PT services much earlier in new subdivisions for the long-term future of our communities. I commend the balance of my submission for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mark. Have we got some questions? Councillor um, Scott, Peter Scott. The 4,000 sections over what time frame? Eh? <laughs> 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 and, uh, we'd all love to be able to answer that question, Peter. It'll take you know, six months to process the plan changes, and then it, they've, currently Ralston is growing extremely fast. You cannot get on the open market a section in Ralston today. Um, the uptake may be very fast. We'd all like to know the answer of how fast it's going to be, but we cannot predict it. Councillor Phil Clearwater. Thank you, Mark, for, for your submission and for your critique. And, Mark, I just want, um, wondered if, like, in terms of uh, what might work for the peer, peer review, would, there's two questions really about. One is, would having a flat fare for, for example, residents out at Rolleston, especially like, the, as you know, you have to sit longer on the bus anyway, would a flat fare approach uh, be something that people like yourself and people from Rolleston will be interested in? The other question I have too, Mark, was you, you'll recall that there previously was like a public transport advisory group of passengers. Is, is that, I'm just wondering if, uh, that, if ECAN could really um, uh, resurrect that to get that going again, if there might be people like your good self in Rolleston who um, might be able to be part of that advisory group. I'll answer the second question first. PTAG was, I thought, a great group. It offered a wider range of perspectives on the use of public transport than you get from elected members and staff. So it, I would welcome its resurrection because I think you wouldn't, you may not have ended up with teal buses if PTAG had had a chance to offer an opinion on it. Um, because I felt that I not only did I represent on that group as an elected member, I also represented the visually disabled a group that's often overlooked. Um, flat fares, yes. A single fare zone, Selwyn, or at least the eastern part of Selwyn to Christchurch, would be great. I did the quick calculation. If I looked at simply the cost of petrol alone, I would have been cheaper for me to drive here than catch the bus, particularly as I've had to wait for my speaking slot. I've missed the chance to get back on the same fare. I could drive here for a less fuel cost than it cost me on the bus. But I came on the bus, it also takes... 65 minutes, Ralston to the exchange, about 25 minutes now during the middle of the day in the car. Those are what you ha we have to overcome. That it is much easier for people to say, no, nah, I'll just drive. It's more convenient, it's cheaper. It's not cheaper, the true cost of motoring isn't that cheap. But that's the perception. And by having a two fare zone structure from Selwyn, and I get that feedback all the time, it just makes it much harder to sell as a viable proposition for commuters. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor John Funkel. No, thank you, Mark. You mentioned uh, you, your thoughts around an increase in, in a targeted rate for, for transport. Are you giving a personal view? I'll, I'll ask a similar question to Mayor Sam later um, of how we do get that wider service in and maintain it in Selwyn. That is my personal view. That's why I started by saying this is, I'm not here in any other role apart from a personal rate pay. We think we have two levels of public transport targeted rate and so on, and that was my advocacy some years ago that got it to be a targeted rate rather than capital value. Um, and I think an increase in that, in amongst other rate increases, would not be noticed by the average rate part. In fact, it's much fairer, and my, urban, my rural friend from Ashburton might like to note that we don't charge a capital value rate for public transport and so on, well, you don't. It's a flat rate, and when the rural rate pays, it's about a tenth of what urban rate pays pay. But I think, yes, 
an increase in services because more people on buses benefits even those who don't use buses. It benefits us all. Councillor Grant each. Thanks, Mike. Just quickly, it sounds like you know, there are a whole lot of transport issues that maybe need to be reviewed as part of a package, possibly. You, you tick the box on um, liking us to see uh, investing in on-demand uh, public transport services. Is that what's your feeling on that, and how could that assist the overall package and stuff? If the if the trial in Tamaru is successful, then I believe that Ralston is another example of a growing township where it could also be useful. We have the the, the, pub, the bus services are mainly to the main south road, northern side of Ralston. But Ralston now is growing to Selwyn Road, if you're familiar with the area. It's a large area. And if we want to get people out of their cars, even within that township, then a, a, a my way type service would work um, to get them around, again, simply to reduce the reliance on their personal vehicle. Because once they're in a car, it's much harder to get them out and leave it at home. Thank you. Well, I don't think there's any more questions, but um, thank you very, very much for coming in and um, making the points you've made today. We really do appreciate it, and obviously your... Oh, Councillor Grant, you're muted. Um, oh, we'd like to welcome to the table uh, Shona Powell. Are you here? Uh, Shona, if you'd like to come up, we really, really apologise that you've had to wait so long. Our timing's not so good, is it? It does. So sorry about that. But thank you for coming anyway. It's a real. A real sure, I'm not breaching any rules. So. So off you go. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm joined by Councillor Philip Redman from the Waimakere District Council, who also sits on the Woody and Sefton Community Board. Um, so it's my name is Shona Powell, and I chair the Woody and Sefton Community Board. It's in the Waimakere District. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it includes Woody End, Woody End Beach, Ravenswood, Pegasus, Waikuku, Waikuku Beach, Sefton, and a reasonably large rural area. So we represent and advocate for this rapidly growing area. Um, first off, I would like to say that the, the greater the greater Christchurch partnership, we, we truly support this. It is a good thing with the councils working together. The board does support the submission that has been made by the Waimakariri District Council, and I understand that you'll be hearing from the mayor tomorrow. So averages are interesting, but the key is the actual impact. Christchurch ratepayers may only be facing a 3% increase, but in Waimakariri, the increases, increases are substantially larger. So some examples under option one. For a property with a CV of $445,000 in Woody End, the increase is 34%. Pegasus with a CV of $510,000, the increase is 32.5%. We cannot beat Keith with a 90% <laughs> sorry, but it is for competition, right? <laughs> um, so for those on low or fixed incomes, this level, we believe this level of increase is unaffordable and unsustainable. And our reasoning there is it will compound year after year. Once that increase is there, it's there and it just grows. So for another example, a property with a CV of $305,000 in Rangiora. So that may very well belong to someone that can probably least afford the proposed increase of 37.1%. There needs to be some equity. This proposed increase will take a large bite out of low income household budgets. These people often just cannot afford it. So incomes are not going up for many to meet the increase costs of living. 
and there are those that are struggling with the financial impacts of COVID-19. To put it into perspective, most DHB nurses have been offered an annualised increase of 1.38%. You cannot just look at the rate increase you have proposed in isolation. You must also consider affordability and be cognizant of all the other costs that are increasing for households versus their income levels. With all respect, we would ask, where is the justification that the increase limit that ECAN themselves have set at 5.3% should be exceeded to the extent of the proposed 24.5% under option one? And when I look at one McEnary, the much higher increase. Where is the justification? So we would like to see costs and projects spread over multiple years, rather than the unaffordable year one increase proposals. Staff could then be moved between projects as they are completed, rather than the, than the in expense of increasing staff numbers to the level proposed, which we understand is over 70 FTEs. Borrowing for projects with longer term benefits would allow repayments to be spread over a number of years funded by rates. With interest rates at historically low levels, this wouldn't be financially prudent. So income is only one side of the equation and how the dollars are spent on projects needs to be reviewed and prioritised with greater transparency. The people deserve to know the detail of the proposed projects, their timeframes and the costs. I will follow on from, from Mark on the passenger transport, <laughs> which as some know is one of the things I'm quite interested in. So less than 18 months ago, the new commuter services from Kaiapoi and from Rangiura to the city were consulted on. They seem to be working well, it's good. Users park and ride, but that has been the only consultation where we were told costs would increase in this case, we were told it was a maximum of $30 for each urban ratepayer. The previous service review for Waimakariri was conducted on the basis that it had to be within an existing budget. And this was reiterated many, many times. And yet with the latest proposed increase, this coming year of just under $50, this would mean that the increase for the two years is an eye-watering 92%. $74.64. We have been told that $29 of the proposed increase relates to costs which are shared great across Greater Christchurch. For example, fair stimulus packages, the impact of COVID-19 on patronage, support services and inflation. And yet this does not appear to be the case with the urban transport rate for Salwan, which is only increasing by $2.69. They will be paying $109.74 per household. And Waimakariri, we will be paying $155.74. We ask that you analyse the costings and review the proposed increase in conjunction with the Waimakariri District Council. Overall, the rate revenue sought from Waimakariri residents for, for public transport is $2.7 million whilst the rate revenue sought from Salwan residents is $1.82 million. Perhaps, Mark, we're paying some of yours. <laughs> no, I've actually looked at services. So where is the equity and fairness? We ask that you also work with your partners to review the targeted passenger transport rates across Greater Christchurch. It probably doesn't help that if I was to catch a bus here to present to you today at my allotted time for my allotted 10 minutes, and then I was able to hop straight back on a bus, it would take four and a half hours out of my day. I live in Pegasus. This is not a viable alternative, so I drove. It took 29 minutes. 
that's not what we want. But I cannot afford four and a half hours out of my day for a 10 minute speaking slot. And, and then I'm expected to pay $155.74 as a targeted rate, plus the bus fare, plus what I pay in my taxes. So in summary, it probably also didn't help when we read things in the newspaper. And the quote from the chair around the proposed increases is to make a contribution maybe a little greater than you have in the past and to do it willingly. Our message is that the proposed increase is not a little greater and without transparency and information on specific projects, the timeframes and the costs of those projects, how can it be done willingly? Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you very much for coming in, Shona. Um, that's excellent. Um, uh, Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. Um, I just have a question. Um, your submission is around affordability, but I noticed that you didn't mention um, the Uniform Annual General Charge, which we've increased um, in order to decrease the cost for the large rural properties. So it means the smaller properties do pay more. Um, you haven't sort of commented on that. What was the reason for that? A lot of it, sorry, a lot of it was actually just the overall affordability. Um, and then to be honest, the most information we could gather was around the, the targeted passenger transport rate. Um, there is just a lack of information about the projects that that money is going to be spent on. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lan Farm. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Shona, and apologies again for the timing. Um, I'm going to hone in again on the affordability, and I think there's clear um, a response that we need around the PT stuff. You've raised some clear questions there. I guess um, I wanted to come back to sort of in your introduction, you say the aspirations that you can have in our LTP are admirable. So clearly there's some, you know, support there, but are you feeling like, because um, I guess the rationale is that we're trying to put action and expenditure behind the aspiration. We don't want it to just be aspiration. But do you feel like the affordability actually outweighs that? Would you prefer that we were greatly cutting our expenditure and not responding to the larger environmental issues that we are purporting to as part of? projects to be identified, prioritised, spread over a number of years. There has to be a budget. We all work to budgets. There has to be a budget that is worked to. It cannot be just, we want to do everything. We want to do it now. So just hang on tight. I'm sorry, affordability. And it is all stated, also stated as one of ECAM's values is around that. Thanks, Shona. Um, in your submission, you referred to borrowing and, and say uh, that we could we could spread our costs with borrowing and that you'd like to see us do that where there is intergenerational benefits um, and that many of our projects do have that. Are you able to refer to which projects they might be? Um, obviously, we're in a different position to territorial authorities in terms of capital project spending. Could you give an example of the types of projects you would uh, encourage or, or like to, us to look at borrowing for? can't say I've thought of a particular project or anything. And yeah, that is actually part of the problem is there is actually very little information about specific projects. Um, so it becomes very difficult. But a lot of the, the, the really valuable work around planting, around you know, climate change does have intergenerational benefits. And we have you know, we're not saying we don't want it to happen, but what we are saying is there needs to be some look at the affordability for people. Right, thank you very much. Any other questions? No, I think that's all. We'll think. Oh, look, Councillor Vicky Southworth. Hi, thank you for your 
um, all the information that you've shared with us and your, your thoughts. I'm interested in it. So it sounds like you were interested in looking at using the bus and you find that it's not, it's just simply not viable and totally understand that four and a half hours of travel. But at the same time, you're saying that the cost of a targeted rate for the bus is too high. And I'm just wondering, to sort of delve into that a bit more, is it that it's too high for the quality of the service and that actually if it were a good service that you were actually able to use, you could leave your car at home, potentially family could even go to maybe a one-car family um, if the public transport is sufficient to, to meet a lot of your needs. Is that part of the decision or the thinking that needs to go into where we're looking to head? Or is it simply that you just simply, as communities cannot afford more, and therefore we have to essentially continue with what's a substandard service at the end of the day? So where, where do you sit with those competing? I mean, part of the issue is, is that the only service increase was cost of at $30. But yeah, it's gone up much more than that. Um, but yes, the service, yeah, when we did have the service review, there had to be so many compromises to try and get a new service squeezed in there, which then meant, um, you know, other things disappeared. Um, an example is in Pegasus, we lost a, a fair chunk of our bus route. So now, you know, some people are having to, if they want to catch a bus, it's a 22 minute walk to the bus stop. Um, and we have we put in a service, we wanted a service that ran between Woody and Pegasus and ran Bura. Our idea had always been actually a loop service between Rangiora, Kaiapoi, Woody and Pegasus. Um, but it just became a Woody and Pegasus to Rangiora service. Um, but it's, it is only 11 kilometres away. And to have to walk 22 minutes to get the bus, which then only runs hourly, um, most people just don't have that time. And so it's shortening the route has almost set the service up to fail. You know, and we, we have felt that the board has felt that the service, the way it was put into place, it was actually almost set up to fail. Um, but certainly, you know, we are a huge supporter of bus services. I mean, we would like to see, uh, because the Woody and Pegasus area is growing so rapidly, we would also like to see at some point, you know, a park and ride facility there uh, with a commuter bus coming in from there. We want to get people off, off the roads as much as possible. Um, I mean, I'm fortunate I don't usually have to drive in at peak hours, so I'm not part of the, the peak hour problem. Um, but, yeah, during the day, when you when your bus service is only hourly, that makes it very difficult. Right, thank you very much, Shona. That was excellent, and thanks for coming all the way. In. Um, it's very good of you. Thank you both. All right. Um, the next person to come up to the table um, will be Ravik Kars Karasak. Uh, don't you? Don't you? Um, I come from Israel, so that was a bit odd. Um, I've been sitting here for about an hour and I heard a lot of no, 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 no. I'm here to say yes. Um, I'll start with the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, my work, I work in probation. There is a lovely small Tonga behind us. I work in the Otto Kakino. The Otto Kakino worked twice in a world for the most improved waterway in New Zealand. We had 37% reduction of nitrogen in the water. It can be done. Uh, myself, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease about six years ago. There is start to come an idea that there is linkage between Crohn's disease and nitrogen in the river, in water. So I'm a victim of that. But I fought for it and we have the award. Um, the council, 11 months ago, you announced climate change emergency. Great. Now it's time to act. Nobody likes to pay. We all want more, more, more. We want more 
buses. We want them to run faster. But we have this wonderful urban floor, you know, going all the way to Pegasus, going to Rollstone. That's a problem that we have done ourselves, shot ourselves in the leg by doing this urban sprawl, and the houses are too big, and then it takes 20 minutes to walk to the bus stop. We are all shouting out, oh my God, it's 100% increase in rates. Yeah, it's $100. Put it in perspective. We can say in, in stats, there are lies, big lies and stats. If we talk about percentage, yeah, it sounds very horrible. $10 a month, $15 a month, that's not going to break us. So I'm for it. And if that's mean more public transport, meaning less people need to use the, the car, that's great. That's one part of the things. Coming back to Zotto Kakino, I've been working there for nine years, planted with the uh, probation guys 85,000 natives. Down the stream, we planted another 20,000 trees. In your, in your uh, proposal, you said that you're going to use government money to do a lot of restoration. I'm for it. We're talking about long term plan, though. The budget from the government is for the next five years. I know that you need to go back to, this, to plant that you planted and take care of them. Just planting is not enough. Planting is the easy part, believe me. I still crawl into Blackberry and into gorse and stuff five years after we planted an area. You need to make sure that the budget have the money to protect what we're going to do. Otherwise, it's useless. Um, I have put in my submission, I think four years ago, Dan Sandal, we have seen let to make baby formula in, in Dan Sandal. The people in Dan Sandal can't feed their, their babies formula because the tap water is lives with nitrogen and they have the blue face syndrome. So there is a problem. And it's nice to say to farmers, well, I'm paying too much money and, and you charge me for something I don't need to do. If it's if it's if the idea of, of uh, user pay, let's pay for nitrogen, not for the water. Let's pay for the end result. That's everybody needs to pick up the bill. And I'm coming back now to the ugly. We are having an option of resource consent. If someone doesn't apply to the resource consent, then we come and sue them, maybe. But there is an incident that someone has not applied for a resource consent, take a huge damage, and we do nothing with it. Instead of signing an agreement that we can't talk about it. And I'm referring to Kaito ETSP. A third of the very rare native plants was gone under your watch. I'm sorry, not good enough. So it's nice to say about climate declaration. It's nice to say we're going to do all this stuff. Planting is good. Protecting what we have is more important. Please make sure we do it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your uh, submission. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, Councillor Farm. Kia ora, thank you so much for your submission. Um, I just wanted to hone in on your, your saying that you'd like us to do more and you'd be willing to pay for it. What, I mean, you've, you've mentioned biodiversity as one area and some in compliance within your submission. Uh, would those be the key areas that you'd like to see more expenditure or do you want to expand on that? I think that using the government money is, is a great idea. We just need to make sure that we have money to maintain it once the government money is gone. I think what's already there, it's perfect, it's good, it's a good start. I mean, Candeberry, I have a friend ecologist and he said that when you land in an international airport, you go through the duty free and you have no idea where you are till you go outside. Candeberry plane is the duty free, we don't know where in New Zealand. Just look like dairy farm out of England or whatever. You need to sort of go into the foothills to start to understand you in Canterbury, yes, that's any New Zealand. So, we lost a lot. We have the money. Let's use it, but make sure that it's going to sustain and not just disappear once the central government is gone. Thank you, uh, Councillor Each, Did you have a question? Probably been answered. Thanks for me. Share your ideas. So thank you very much. Very important. Now, I'd like to invite to the table Mayor Sam Broughton from the Selwyn District Council. Thank you very much for coming in and sorry to hold you up as well. Kia ora koutou everyone and thank you for um, allowing me to come and present the submission for the time you've taken to, to read all the submissions that you've received and listen to the people that are keen enough to come in uh, and talk to you here. 
Um, particularly like to acknowledge Ngāi Te Rua Hikihiki Whānau uh, present and um, uh, particularly Craig sitting here and David behind me, connections to Tomutu um, and the relationship we and so on have with, um, with Tomutu is very important to us. Uh, and we'd like to also raise uh, Ngāi Tahu's relationship with Canterbury Councils uh, as being key to our future together. Uh, and the 1998 Ngāi Tahu Settlement Act uh, paragraph 8, the very end of the apology says we'll enter into new age of cooperation um, and that's 23 years ago now uh, and we're only starting to make um, inroads into what a new age of cooperation might look like after 150 years of NATO who've been cut out of many things that they would have wanted to um, hold Ranga Te Ratanga for and um, continue to show leadership and so well done um, to weekend on the, st the steps that you're taking um, to redress um, past hurt and to look forward uh, to that new age of cooperation. I particularly want to acknowledge Jenny uh, and your leadership, Jenny, of um, Environment Canterbury, the work that we have together on um, the mural forum and your expertise in wanting to bring leadership, collaboration and partnership uh, together. And as uh, Mark mentioned before, it's appreciated the way that uh, the mural forum is um, funded, uh, the support is funded through ECAN and that continuing, I think, really important for Canterbury Councils to continue to, to collaborate together. Uh, there's a number of, th of things in the um, submission which um, I don't want to, to labour on, so I'll just touch on some, some highlights and then um, leave the rest of the time for questions. So particularly around um, the government's essential fresh water package and the um, effects uh, on the agricultural sector, um, they are massive, uh, and the changes that the agricultural sector has been um, put through over the last 10 years has resulted in major change um, of unfarm practices and, uh, and change within families and in, uh, within businesses too. Uh, we, we need to continue to improve the situation uh, uh, further, um, but we need to also recognise the cost that it comes at and uh, report that no doubt uh, Neil Brown, Mayor of Ashburton, has presented and talked to you about in um, a similar uh, lot of research around the effect of uh, nitrates and water in the Selwyn district uh, and what that means for other well-beings across our district uh, show that there's um, pretty massive change required uh, to meet some some of the numbers. Uh, we'd really like to see um, Te Wahora uh, access enabled uh, and think that the construction of a, a cycle walkway around Te Wahora um, would allow people to be much more aware of the lake, its beauty, um, the way that it feeds uh, many uh, and uh, yeah, currently tucked away and, and reasonably hard to access and again owns a lot of land around uh, the lake so looking at how we might actually open up access and working with Te Wahora co-governors um, on that um, would be something we'd like to, to see um, and also the removal of uh, four-wheel drive access to the bed of uh, Te Wahora and again the co-governors were presented with some research around the, the just absolute devastation that one pass of a four-wheel drive vehicle does to um, the the lake bed uh, when, when it's um, going up and, and coming down and it just seems like a really simple simple fix if we could just put some um, some blocks in the way so it's not that people can't get there it's just that um, four wheel drives are probably not the most appropriate way um, to race all over um, the lake. Uh, public transport has been talked about in the last couple of submissions and we'd like to see um, an improvement in public transport in the Selwyn district uh, particularly a further introduction of low emissions vehicles uh, and procuring them locally where uh, you can. There's a bus builder in Rolleston employing 120 people uh, that's got the technology and the expertise to provide buses to New Zealand uh, and we don't need to keep bringing them in from overseas um, and just encourage you to, to look at that and we're working on a date for a visit uh, in the next few weeks I think it is um, and you're all more than welcome to come and, and check out what they are able to do. A uh, single fare structure for the district would be um, appreciated and would help people uh, get on buses and stay on buses and um, Mark raised that uh, earlier on as well. Uh, the introduction of a service between Lincoln University and Hallsville, noting the number of people that are attending Lincoln University, but at the moment they're having to drive out of the city uh, to attend there. Um, there is the services um, to Leaston is currently, uh, we're about to be stopped uh, because of the patronage that hasn't been there, but at the same time a service um, to Darfield was trialled and has been um, successful. And so we'd like to see an expansion of that service because as was noted earlier, if I was to catch the bus to come here to present this, it would be an 11 hour return trip. Uh, catch the bus at 7 a.m. and I'd get back at 6 tonight to do my uh, 10 minutes here. So, uh, the ability to be able to travel a bit more frequently uh, would be good, even if it's just a second service that comes in at 10 and goes back at 3 rather than the, the 7 and 5. 
um, would mean that those of a different age group or those that need to go home earlier would be able to um, access Christchurch, but equally those that live in Christchurch can access the country uh, and travel the other way. I think one of the big misconceptions about the motorway is it's made people get into the city faster. It's actually made people be able to leave the city a whole lot faster um, as well, and we're seeing people coming to Rolleston. We just don't have Rome Street at the end uh, with a backlog to show how many cars are, are there that people can access off our end a little bit easier. Um, internally within Selwyn, we don't have um, public transport to connect our towns other than um, a service between Lincoln and uh, Rolleston and, and Burnham. And so linking up Leaston and Darfield to Rolleston, I think it's going to be key um, and, and we'd like to see that service put in. Uh, the MyWay service in Timaru has currently been trialled again, uh, Mark said earlier. Uh, why not see that trial actually extended to some other places in Rolleston? I think it would be a really great space to have that. It's uh, about 5 k's from one side of Rolleston to the other. There's no public transport within the town. Uh, so if you're not walking, you're driving, uh, and that means everyone's driving um, because no one is, is doing that 5k lap uh, or 10k return trip. Uh, if they live out the back of Barrington to get into town. So we need a service within inside, inside the district. Uh, and one of the questions will be how do we pay for that? And there has been a, a targeted run, a targeted rate um, piece. Uh, and I think that uh, should continue. Um, but um, we would like to see, and it would have been great to have seen uh, you come out to the community saying, hey, here's, here's five services we'd love to um, give to you. Here's what it's going to cost. And I know you're under pressure with the feedback around how much rates rises are. But that's the only way you actually hear where people are at by pushing the boat out, or, you know, a bit, and actually pushing the boat out maybe a bit too far sometimes, uh, and then realising you've got to reel it back the wee bit. Uh, and we're not feeling that for passenger bus services in Selwyn, the boat's been pushed out at all. Uh, we've just got a bit of status quo and, and maybe a little bit tweaking, and we would like to see better um, for for our district. Uh, engagement with the community uh, around climate change is good, and we just um, you've it's time Canterbury um, piece of work, and I think it's going to be great just to engage our communities and. Uh, the good work that's going on, but also the changes that are going to need to occur around climate change. Uh, continuing to work with landowners uh, and helping them understand biodiversity initiatives that they might be able to do on their own lands has been good, and particularly encourage the work that you've done to bring biodiversity champions from across Canterbury together to think about actually how we have a joined up approach to, to biodiversity. Um, and lastly, the Alps to Ocean um, has been a huge success, obviously, for um, Omaru, uh, Waitaki District, and, and through the Mackenzie. Uh, when that was first mooted, there was some work that we did with you uh, on an Arthur's Pass to the Sea uh, route that followed some of the transalpine um, space. Uh, we would love to see that picked up again. We've put some money in our um, long-term plan for a feasibility study to, to see how that might land. We're also currently going through um, spending $10 million on a pipeline to take wastewater from um, Darfield to Rolleston uh, to be treated. And on top of that, considering whether or not instead of just putting dirt and grass, we look at putting a bike track and actually using some of the diggers that are on site to do the work at the same time. Um, so connecting Arthur's Pass to the ocean, uh, to the city, to the rivers, out to Tewahora, um, the links are already there through the rail trail. It's actually making them connect and you working with us on that uh, would be um, would be appreciated. And it takes me through most of the matters that are here, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you, uh, Mayor Sam, for that um, report. It's great. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor uh, Ian McKenzie was first. Uh, thank you, Sam, for your submission. Uh, in terms of public transport funding, uh, and, and you talked about targeted rates, fares, various other things, um, what, 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 are there all other other alternatives in terms of uh, perhaps innovative ways of considering fare packages, such as seasons passes or things like that, that might a give the commitment from your ratepayers to public transport, and b give ECAN the certainty that it would get the funding to put on those services that you think could work? Yeah, I just think try some stuff. Uh, that the way that things have always worked around public transport are failing us. So we're going to have to come up with some different models and different ways of doing it. And if try, try a season pass, the word trial is so good because you can start something and give it a go. And if it fails, uh, you've learned a whole lot through the process. Don't be afraid of failure. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I like that thinking. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Sam. And my question again is on, on continuum of the beach tonight, at least. What, what you, you've talked about the target of rating, the need to build. Sponsorship or a subsidisation out of Selwood. 
of your service was where maybe five thousand dollars was enough to make that enough service that was up there at the moment. Um, then we would look at rendering for the change that animates it happen. How I guess um, helpful could you be to try to make those services work in a, in a collaborative kind of space? Uh, I, we haven't discussed that, so this is just me speaking rather than on behalf of our council. Uh, I think at the very beginning of this, we underwrote the first year of the trial to, to try and get something off the ground. Uh, we've now left the community to give it a shot, and where it's been used well, great, where it hasn't been used, the community's had a chance to have that go. I think it would be quite difficult for us to fund um, anything extra to make that happen. Uh, we would see the funding needing to come through existing streams rather than extra on top of our own. Our own rights. Thank you very much, Sam, for your submission. Wide ranging. Um, I really um, am excited actually about the um, your, your feasibility study for the Mountains to Sea project. Um, that was, uh, you might recall, that was suggested by I think Councillor Nicole Reeve from your council to resurrect that. And I just wondered, um, I just hope that in fact, though, the feasibility study, we can make sure that we include the, the latest technology. Like, I was highly impressed when I was down at um, down in Central Otago recently and, and the whole, tra tra whole trail, um, much of it, of the rough parts, are Klingons. So there's new, there's new technology, which I'm sure we can um, we, we can um, borrow from, from our southern neighbours. I also, I'm assuming too, though, that, or I'm wondering, Point of order, this is question rude, Phil, but we are quite behind time. I just like if we could get to the question, please. Sure. So um, I just wonder if um, thank you, if um Christchurch City Council might also be able to partner in the in the cycleway project. Uh, yeah, we would look at the, the route that makes sense uh, and talk with our partners uh, around that. We'd love for you to be included. Uh, as you have been in the initial um, stages probably 10 years ago now. Uh, we'll be talking with Christchurch as well. Thank you, Sam. Any other questions? Councillor Megan Hand. At this, thanks for your submission, Sam. On behalf of the Council, at the study of submission, you refer to the Canterbury Water Management Strategy and the um, catchment approach that we have taken in the past rather than at a national level um, degree. Are you able to expand on that at all in terms of what you would be asking of us in terms of a position around that, uh, if, if any at all, given that same? Yeah, I guess that's saying that uh, one size fits all approach hasn't suited Canterbury um, from a national space, and one size fits all across Canterbury doesn't fit Selwyn either. And so the answers that Selwyn's come up with uh, have been quite different than those uh, in Pakoda or in a different in a different catchment. Uh, and so really, this is saying let's continue with the catchment approach, which I think is. We've made really good progress over the last 10 years. The Canterbury Water and Management Strategy, I think it's a great document that um, sets a direction well. The zone committees and the refresh that we went through uh, last year uh, has been an important part of tweaking, and there's probably a little bit more tweaking there to go, meetings for the sake of meetings, and um, you know, just gathering isn't the point anymore. There was a lot of work that was required at the very beginning uh, to set up the rules and to understand the zips and the zippers, uh, whereas now actually there's a lot of work on maintaining uh, and on community engagement or continued community engagement on, on where we go. I guess that's really what I was saying. Councillor um, Yain, Benmore. Tēnā koe, Sam. This is with regards to, to Waihora um, and regarding to your uh, uh, cycleway trail around the lake. How far has that kind of got on with Coe Gardens and have you, has that been talked about around the table? So many people talk about it in a sentence and no one picks it up and runs with it and says, how much further could we go before we need to make a decision, yeah or, not, yeah or nay? Is there, a, is there a feasibility piece? Is there a business case? How do we get beyond an idea? And you guys as major landowners and a, a group that brings people together already, uh, can you help me on the Te Wahuruko governance space work with uh, Tamuta and everyone else that's, that sits there to say, can we get a, a, a great project off the ground that's going to lift public awareness and availability to access the lake. There's lots of places maybe that shouldn't have as much public access. And we're, you know, we're going to have to talk through what that what that's going to mean, and there'll be cultural sensitivities that needs to be understood. Uh, but that shouldn't stop us thinking a bit bigger, I think, than where we're at at the moment. Uh, a very good answer, by the way, even though I'm not supposed to say that since I'm on co as well. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so the next person was, please indicate again, Vicky, Councillor Vicky South, Southwood. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sam, for, for all the information that you've given us. I'm just interested in the submission, you mentioned education of our communities on the effects of climate change. And I'm just wondering, you won't refer specifically to its time, Canterbury, and then um, there's also, for example, mention of contestable fund community groups in support for that, which is a sort of indirect way of education as well, getting people on board. But you don't mention Enviro schools in here, and I'm just wondering what your position is on the Enviro schools programme. <laughs> yeah, we, we support Enviro schools. We pay for some of that ourselves um, with the rates that we collect number of Enviro schools across so I think it's a, a great way of getting young people involved and in understanding waterways and biodiversity around around them but also the effects of climate change and whether it's adaption or mitigation I think both are now within scope um, of what our communities are going to have to look at. All right well I'm going to say thank you very much Mayor Sam for coming in and making such a good uh, submission we really appreciate it and um, thank you for giving up your time today it's excellent. Yeah, yes that'd be great. Sorry, it's the Waimakuri River to the north, the Rakai River to the south, Te Wahora spreads out here. Uh, who will care for this place, being so in district, Waikiri Kitty district? Uh, I will, you will, uh, we will together. So thank you for your time today. Yes, thank you, Sam. All right, um, off the break. we're going to have a five minute break and we really apologise to everybody who's in a hurry and who's been waiting a while. But we were going to take 15, but we're going to take five. So sorry about that. We just need to stand up and have a minute. Thank you. All right, we're going to get started again. Uh, we're sorry about taking that break, but um, we, are, um, we are all humans and we're trying to just um, have, a good, have a relationship with uh, people that are coming um, as best we can in restricted circumstances. So I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to ask change the order a little bit because um, otherwise the person who's come to submit is going to miss their bus. So I'd like Chris Horn to come to the table if you don't mind. And apologies to other people. I hope you're not missing your bus exactly. <laughs> well, I didn't do a survey. <laughs> Over you go, Chris. I'll be very quick. Uh, I'm oh, yeah, pop your button on. Like that? Yes, much better. Okay, um, I'll be quick. Uh, so, and I guess, you know, most of you will have had a look at these uh, things. So I don't have an awful lot to add except to just say, yes, please, please, please actually do put the rates up. <laughs> please actually do option one, not option two. Um, and, and there are things that you could be doing and perhaps should be doing that are not being done as well. So uh, I'm, I'm reasonably concerned about uh, the potential state of Christchurch's water, and I've talked about that. I'm reasonably concerned about um, some of the issues that may or may not be being looked after, the pesticide, potential for pesticides and things in water. Um, so I'd like to see more being done there. I think more could be done in transport, and particularly around um, behaviour change work, because it's all very well putting on public transport, but actually we have a city that's got really low use of public transport, and it needs people to be thinking about how they do it in different ways. And it seems like an expensive way of doing it, but actually we actually we have to sit down with people and 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 help them see that it's not actually a big deal to catch a bus <laughs> or to take a bike and then catch a bus or walk or whatever. Um, so I think there is more that could be being done there that would make better use of what we already have. And as we improve the network, then um, that becomes also a better thing in terms of use. Uh, and I don't think was anything else that I really want to kind of hammer away at. Oh, the UAGC, um, which has more than doubled, that concerns me quite considerably. Um, it, it, it's not fair to be 
putting that on low uh, low income households. I live in a quite quite high income area, and honestly, people like me should be paying more, not not be putting it onto households that really can't afford it. So I'd just like to say, please make that a lot smaller and make everything as progressive as possible. Well, thank you, Chris, and thanks for coming in. We have a question for you from Councillor Peter Scott. Can you expand on the regional leadership uh, piece that you have in your submission? Um, okay. Uh, uh, your button, Chris. Chris, your button. I'm off again. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd be keen to see. I, I I do lots of work in my local community, um, and I do lots of sort of work on the ground to try and build awareness of some of the stuff that's going on. But I know that people in my community know almost nothing about the regional council. They get things horribly muddled up, um, and they seem to think that. You know, our organisation, the Halls of Community Project, has been accused of not doing things that the Regional Council does. I mean, that's how ignorant people are. Uh, so there is there's a job to be done to help people understand local government, whether that's council or regional council. And regional council are most definitely part of that. So I guess that's what I'm thinking about there. Uh, uh, Councillor Phil Clearwater. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, you've made a lot of really interesting suggestions. One is um, I see that around the fare box recovery, you, your comment is that you're agnostic about free public transport, but then you refer to um, the possibility of it being done on a limited time basis. And I'm wondering if, for example, if Christchurch has special events and like Anzac Day, yes, there might have been one. There's lots of examples. If that's the kind of thing, way that perhaps we could uh, have some buses free at, for, for some particular periods. Yeah, any of anything like that, and even if you wanted to drive to try and um, build the use of the buses, I mean, there are all sorts of things that people have talked about doing. I, I remember being on um, a standing committee with the council years ago, and we talked about a bus row gain, <laughs> so that people get to know the network and understand how they can get around the city uh, by changing buses and moving about and actually having to engage with the timetable. So. Um, but, but a lot of it is, you know, people are really busy. I know this because I try to organise stuff and it's hell trying to get people out and to listen and to hear things. Um, and so actually, you know, we need some ways of getting them to sit up and go, oh, I suppose I could give that a go, you know, or yeah, that might work, or um, I'll go and try that because it looks like fun. I think we just need a, a, a multiplicity of ways of trying to uh, get that behaviour change happening. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Chris? All right, look, we really appreciate you taking the time to come here, Chris. I hope you catch your bus and thanks very much. And great points you made. Thanks very much. Bye. Um, the next person is Harry. Harry, Harry um, Stronach from the Akaroa Ratepayers and Residents Association. If you'd like to come up, that'd be great, Harry. If you could just press your button so the mic's on. Good afternoon. I represent the Akaro Ratepayers and Residents Association, and I've come to make some comments about your long term plan. Our society looks at the activities of local government such an agency such as ECAN. What we hope to find is common sense decision making, efficient operations, integrity. Normally we see those things, but sometimes are disappointed. Your draft long term plan, it says all the right things, quite a good effort really. Now, who can argue with your vision statement? It says taking action together to shape a thriving and resilient Canterbury now and for future generations. Actually, we do have a few members in our organisation who use that issue with the word thriving because it's getting a little close to the word vibrant that the City Council keep using. But not everybody wants things to be sort of vibrant and thriving. Some people like things to be sort of steady and safe and security they value. But it's the implementation that is the issue. How do we know that all these good intentions are really going to be put into practice? Here is another statement of good intentions. To enable people and communities to provide for their social, economic, and cultural well being and their health and safety. That's objective six out of the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, which has been enforced since 2010. 
And that goes on to say, the protection of the values of the coastal environment does not preclude use and development in appropriate places and forms and within appropriate limits. And you'll note the use of the word appropriate, and you haven't been seeing everything appropriate lately. Further on the coastal policy statement, under policy three, adopt a precautionary approach towards proposed activities whose effects on the coastal environment are uncertain, unknown, and little understood. So the New Zealand coastal policy statement, it's only 20 pages long, it says all the right things. Policy statements are like that. They also always say the right things. It's a bit like long-term plans. You know, it's always some, it's always summer in a long-term plan. You never see you never see photos of winter and rain and people sleeping in doorways and so forth. So over the next few years, ECAN are going to be revising the Regional Coastal Plan, and in the course of doing that, you're going to put more meaning into the coastal policy statements. And according to your discussion documents, there's going to be extensive consultation and community engagement. That sounds really good for the future, and we're going to be part of it. But if we look back for the moment over the past few years, I have been quite critical of ECAN at times, and I think with good reason. Let's just consider for a moment what's actually been happening in Akaroa, in the Akaroa Harbour. I, I know you were, you, would, uh, uh, you had Victoria Andrews and Mike Norris this afternoon. You would have seen the photos of the ships and you'll understand to some extent what they can do. So we were having 90 to 100 ships a year discharging close to 200,000 passengers into a town with a population of 600 people. Not too much consideration was being given to the social and cultural well-being of that, of that community with all that happened. In November 2018, I pointed out to ECAN and to the cruise ship operators that the ships were acting in breach of the regional coastal plan due to the seabed disturbance. And we're not talking a small breach, we're talking hundreds of times the permitted amount of disturbance. A flurry of activity happened. But unfortunately, the emphasis was on how can we justify continuing to do this? And that's rather at odds with the ideals of taking a precautionary approach. Of course, I should not have had to bring that matter up at all. ECAN should have been on the case. Your people should have known what was written in the, in the uh, Regional Coastal Plan and the Resource Management Act. They should have taken some action about the whole matter six years earlier. And then while we were considering the ship issues, it became apparent that the issue of sewage discharge from ships in the harbour was virtually unregulated. Hard to believe, you might say. There's a general th feeling that an internationally trading ship will be complying with international maritime law, such as the MARPOL regulations. They probably are. But in MARPOL Annex 4, which regulates sewage discharges, there's, a, there's an escape clause. Yes, it says that if the local territorial authority imposes a lesser standard than MARPOL, then the ship can operate down to the lower standard. And the situation is made worse by the fact that New Zealand has not ratified MARPOL Annex 4. We're one of the few countries, apart from the United States, which doesn't ratify anything. We're one of the few countries which hasn't ratified an important document like that. So in Akaroa Harbour, the standard legal standard ends up being more than 500 metres from shore, you can discharge raw sewage. Now, what's the point in the City Council spending $66 million to build a fancy state-of-the-art wastewater treatment plant with onshore discharge so they can avoid putting it into the harbour when the legal situation is that the ship in the harbour can discharge far more of raw sewage? We'll move on. So, we won't quite move on. In, the, in your documents, you say that one of your success factors will be influencing central government decision-making. Well, you can start by getting them to ratify MARPOL Annex 4. So we look to the future and read about your proposals for extensive consultation and community engagement and so forth. We see the size of the budget allocated. Your documents say that you will listen to the people and work together with partners and stakeholders to achieve the expectations of our regional community. What does that really mean? Who will these partners and stakeholders actually be? There will be issues in finding a balance between opposing views. There always is. But should the views of a businessman, for example, or a business owner carry extra weight over those of a ratepayer or a resident? A consultant, probably an economist, would may say that they should. And you'll cite the flow on effects and the economic benefits and the spill down effect. And, you know, and then the next economist 
who may say otherwise, because he'll put more value on social aspects. ECAN has been criticised in the past for giving excessive weight to commercial interests. Your long-term plan documents read as if that attitude has changed. Let's hope that is the case. Communities are there for the long term, and they're far more important than short-term business interests. The Banks Peninsula community, which takes in the township of Akaroa, belongs to the people who are committed to living there and are actively working to make it a sustainable and an ever better place. The outside parties are arriving in town for a quick profit, and we've had plenty of them. They may add something, but they really bring long-term commitment. On the subject of consultation, some words of caution. We are well experienced with the consultation process as it is run by the other the other um, local government entity, Christchurch City Council. The unfortunate fact is that 90% of the people that we have surveyed in Agra think that it's all a sham. They have no faith whatsoever in the consultation process that they've seen local government run. I mean, it's very unfortunate the situation is like that. But nevertheless, that is the case. The city councils talk about strengthening communities and such like is a smokescreen, that's regarded as a smokescreen, for council staff to pursue their own agendas. ECAN is a different organisation. And we hope to see ECAN setting an example and showing how consultation can be made truly meaningful. Your challenge is to put real meaning into the well-worded statements on the subject. And this, the, they're there all through your consultation documents. There's all these statements about community consultation and so forth. Make it meaningful. We will be there at the table. We will have quite a bit to say about our particular topics. We'll bring sensible ideas to the table. We'll be looking for a revised coastal plan that puts sensible limits on the size and numbers and behaviour of ships in Akaroa Harbour. We believe that the subject is so important for the future of our community that limitations and control should be established by a formal process and we would propose that there is a formal poll of the affected people in Banks Peninsula and we will be making submissions on that to the coastal plan when the time comes. Moving on just briefly to another topic, the pest free Banks Peninsula. There is some scepticism as to whether this is achievable and certainly going to be take a mighty effort. I understand there are 14 organisations involved. I hope ECAN are going to take a lead and pull it all together and make it happen. So in conclusion, long-term plan, great, let's do it, do it properly. But remember, it's all about the environment and people and communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question from Councillor Ian McKenzie. Uh, thanks, Harry. Um, you, you said the cruise ships could dump their sewage in the harbour. Were they doing that? Yeah. Oh, uh, who knows? Uh, ECAN weren't doing any monitoring. Probably not. But if they had it, you couldn't you couldn't have stopped them. But there's other New Zealand shipping in the harbour, fishing vessels do. Yeah. All right. Have we got any other questions? Um, Councillor Scott. Yeah, when you talk of we in terms of consultation, who's the we you're talking about? Uh, well, our uh, our organisation um, has over 100 members. It's quite a strong organisation given the size of the local community, uh, and we hold public meetings and so forth, and try to gauge what the what the feeling is. Thank you, Councillor Lamba. Yeah, thanks so much for your challenge to put um, action to these words. My question is around um, particularly Pest Free Banks Peninsula. We've got three million dollars in the long term plan to go towards that, and that's really allowed the seed funding from central government. Are you comfortable with our level of expenditure in leading that in terms of investment, or would you like to see? I'm comfortable with that level of expenditure, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I don't think there's any other questions um, for you. Look, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for coming here, and I'd just like you to know that um, we have engaged with all the residents associations that we know of in our area around this long-term plan and there's been some really good ongoing discussions so we really appreciate you coming forward and um, we're looking forward to engaging you more so thanks very much for taking the time we really appreciate it uh, now i'd like to ask um, nikki stonick from um, forest and birds 
joining from Forestenburg to please come to the table and give us a presentation. Thanks, Nikki, and thanks for taking the time to come along. Pop your speaker on. I've got a conflict of interest. Just this mentioning it. Only as a only as a card carrying member, that's all. I'm not on any other position. Oh, three members. Excellent. Got everybody. Um, thank you very much for um, the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Nikki Snowyank and I'm the Regional Manager for Forest and Bird for Canterbury and the West Coast. Um, Forest and Bird has thousands of supporters throughout Canterbury Region. Many of them are ratepayers and I'm here to speak on behalf of them today. Um, I'm going to speak on five topics. Um, democracy, regional leadership, climate change, land and water and biodiversity and biosecurity. Um, first of all, democracy. We cannot underestimate the impact that 10 years without democracy has had and continues to have on Cantabrians, on the environment and on the processes that govern it. Um, on that note, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And this is one but one important step of the democratic process. So thank you very much. We need you to reinstate democracy in all ECAN's processes, planning, resource consents, everything, especially for matters that impact on the health of our environment and on the people. The recent non-notification and granting of the MHB resource consent is a case in point, which now essentially locks in another 10 years of environmental polluting, albeit with reductions, but that are largely meaningless to nature and to human health. This sort of thing makes a mockery of the central freshwater package, um, whatever aspirations you might have for climate change, and it does actually garner very little confidence in Environment Canterbury as an organisation. So unless you're willing to intervene and immediately seek changes to that process and inc to include the public voice, how can we actually avoid this happening again? Our ask to you is to please make full democracy your priority to close the gap between the public messaging and the practice. On leadership, um, environment, environmental management in Canterbury occurs in an ad hoc way. The recent MFE Our Land Report 2021 was a very concerning synopsis of land use in New Zealand, especially the intensification and loss of productive soils in the bid to grow food and to house people and provide for their well-being. The full well-being is central to the Local Government Act and the need for balance is often referred to. Canterbury's Indigenous Biodiversity Freshwater and the burgeoning nitrate situation suggest that things are way out of balance. Some honest, hard conversations need to be had and meaningful action is required to provide appropriate redress for environmental, social and cultural well-being. As Mayor Sam said, there's a heck of a lot to be done. Forest and Bird appreciates the open door policy that Council has extended to us, but the jury is still out on meaningful action on things that are important to us. As the gap narrows for meaningful action on climate change, freshwater and native species, we strongly encourage you to lead by example, to continue to break down the silos, encourage joined up thinking in the long term interest of the region. Our ask to you is that you continue to fund programs that require cooperation, that include reporting and progress results. For things, for example, like for example, some things like um, the Canterbury Climate Change Working Group that's been around since 2017, I understand. We haven't really heard a lot about them. The Braided Rivers Action Group that doesn't appear to uh, feature in your long term plan and the Mackenzie Basin Agency Alignment Programme that was started a number of years ago that seems to have dropped off the radar as well. We also want you to fund youth engagement beyond Enviro schools. We support Enviro schools, but we want to go beyond that as well, and especially for programmes that promote civics education to further develop our young leaders. On climate change, we think this needs to be elevated as an overarching programme. How you approach climate change needs to be a driver of all your other work programs. As I mentioned above, there is an ad hoc, there's also an ad hoc approach to preparing for climate change. 
territorial authorities around the region are in different states and st stages of developing uh, individual strategies. I know because I have to sort of um, make submissions on them all. Time is now of the essence and it requires coordination and cooperation. We're now four years on since the establishment of the Mayoral Forum and Climate, Climate Group. It's not crystal clear what has been achieved. But with portfolios like land and water, air transport and the coastal environment, we strongly encourage ECAN to take the lead leadership with a regional approach to develop a clear regional strategy so individual TAs can actually be integrated into that. So you're all kind of, you know, pulling in the same direction with targets and milestones to measure and monitor progress. And so elected representatives can be held accountable at election time. On fresh water, it's really, really fantastic to see the water and land portfolio joined up. Well done. Um, polluting land use, particularly nitrate pollution, is a big issue for many, many Cantabrians, especially as they discover their drinking water is undrinkable. A focus on restoration, a faster sinking lid policy on pollution, a meeting minimum flows, and increasing them, caps on water takes, and protecting flood flows are vital to impl implementing the National Policy Statement for Freshwater, the National Environmental Standards, and Te Mana o Te Wai. Our ask to you is that you prioritise RMA planning processes to implement the National Freshwater Policy as quickly as possible. On biodiversity and biosecurity, um, I want to commend the work of Councillor Farm on biodiversity champions. Good stuff, Lan, that's fantastic. Again, there's been an ad hoc implementation in, of Indigenous biodiversity protection and maintenance around the region. The NPS, the National Policy Statement for Indigenous Biodiversity, will soon be gazetted. And this reinforces the role of territorial authorities to identify, map and protect significant natural areas or SNAs. This has been around since 1993 in the RMA, but this NPS cements that and, and, and encourages them strongly to do it, and the supporting role that the regional councils play. I noted in your um, long-term plan that you want to review the Canterbury Biodiversity Strategy. We don't think this is necessary. Its guiding principle is just as valid today as it was in 2008 when this strategy was created. It simply needs implementation, but with much more urgency now. So our ask to you is to develop and implement a plan for identifying, mapping and protecting SNAs with the stakeholders and help them to strengthen planning provisions in their district plans to better protect native species and its habitat. I think this is achievable through your Biodiversity Champions Programme. So yeah, go to it. And also encourage the, the stakeholders, by that I mean the territorial authorities, to bolster their environmental funds to help land occupiers achieve better outcomes for nature. And the Jobs for Nature has already set the foundation for this to happen. Uh, finally, on biosecurity, we strongly support ECAN's biosecurity advisory groups. We have representatives or people from Forest and Bird on those groups throughout the region. Um, biosecurity risks will increase as climate change kicks in. We're already seeing myrtle rust threaten things, species like Pulijukawa, Manuka and Rata. That would be a real worry if it, it made it down here, especially into things like industry like Manuka honey. It is especially, especially vital to have ears and eyes in the community for new biosecurity incursions. So our ask to you is to increase the funding for biosecurity especially for detection and prevention of new incursions. And also for education to bridge that divide between complying with, the bios with biosecurity responsibilities and protecting Indigenous biodiversity. I hear of many, many cases where biosecurity, uh, biodiversity has been wiped off the face of the planet because a farmer has been told to comply with the biosecurity regulations. So it'd be really nice to see that get sorted out. Um, our, um, our ask to you is that we also recommend a review of the Canterbury Pest Management Plan during the lifetime of this long-term plan and to provide an opportunity to add new pests and upgrade management pro programs. However, 
some things can't wait and we need immediate action like feral cats that are decimating our wildlife from the mountains to the sea and Canadian geese that are exploding in numbers and steadfastly reducing amenity value right here on the doorstep in the Avon Otakaro corridor. We, we did raise this with you last year in the City Council, but we do not believe there has been any action at all on that matter. So, and on that note, I shall finish. Kia ora, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Oh, thank you very much for coming in, Nikki. We really appreciate your time. Now, we've got a few questions. First of all, Councillor Ian McKenzie. Thanks, uh, Nikki. Uh, you, you talked, when you were talking about water quality and planning under the RMA, or maybe the reforms of the RMA, you were, the, the, the impression was you were talking mainly about um, agricultural issues with water quality, but are you, is Forest and Bird concerned about the uh, expansion of urbanisation in, in, some, in some of the catchments, especially going into things like Te Wai Hora? I think that the land, our land report suggested that, you know, we had to protect our, uh, our um, productive soils from housing as well as our good soils from intensification as well. So it's a balancing act, isn't it, there to make sure we don't build houses where we can produce food and then produce food in a way that's healthy on the environment. Thank you. Councillor um, Nicole Marshall. Thank you, Chair. Um, Nikki, in your submission, you say that the biodiversity strategy doesn't need revitalising, but the CWMS does. Can you explain why you feel it does, as, and the bag does biodiversity strategy doesn't, given one is older than the other? Well, I think that the do you can yeah. push your button again. Sorry, please. The the guiding principle in the biodiversity strategy is focused first on protecting and ma maintaining what remains and then restoring what has been lost. So that, that still stands today, that's no different. And the CWMS, I guess it had the first order priorities and the second order priorities, and somewhere along the way they got all mixed up, and we need to go right back to those and you know refocus on those first order priorities again. To me, those those first order priorities are consistent with Te Mana or Te Wai. Thank you, Councillor Lampa. Thank you, Nikki. Um, a lot in here. I wanted to pick up specifically, I guess, a continuation of the CWMS aspect and your um, statement about not supporting continued funding of the zone committees or the zone delivery teams. Do you Would you mean you would prefer that that expenditure was cut altogether or are you talking about a diversion of resources towards other areas? Can you help me understand that? Well, I think you're probably quite well aware of our view of the zone committees and to me nothing's changed they are you know especially in the areas where there's a lot of pressure on the resource for irrigation they still appear to be business as usual so you know we have formed the view that nothing has really changed so yeah I, I sort of wonder about the zone delivery teams and zone committees what are they actually achieving so yeah I would probably prefer to see money going to something else Councillor Megan Hands. Thanks, Nikki. Um, thanks for your submission. It's really clear um, where for us and at with most things. Um, the question that had come from your comment around your preference for implementation of um, the national policy statement uh, and prioritising those planning processes. Uh, elsewhere in your submission, you talk about support for some of the more non statutory projects that are in the long term plan. Um, given we'll have to make decisions about travel to the same sitting in our seat, um, is is a definite, your definite prefer, preference that we do the planning work over any of the other uh, on the ground work, or um, can you just give me a steer on that? Yeah, I, I would say if I had to make a choice, I'd go for the planning, the statutory stuff. That's the, the, the framework that governs our environment, environmental management. So if I had to make a choice, that would be it. Thanks. Yeah, of course you need both, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any further questions? All right. Well, I want to say thank you very much, Nikki, for coming in today um, and preparing the submission. It was all very good. So we we really much, very much appreciate you coming in. Thank you very much. I had to go and, I had to go and catch my bus. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. I've got five minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Is, is Mark Duff here? Oh, yes. Hi, Mark. Hi. You're next, so welcome. Come on up. You just need to press the button on that machine. Thanks. Come. Hi, Corey, everybody. Um, I'm speaking as a resident of Hornby, and what is our greatest challenge at the moment concerning the environment? And I really think it is the quarries. Um, one of my roles in chair of my local residents association is with uh, meeting with high school students and talking to them. And there is real concern and trust with Environment Canterbury and the reading of ear monitors. Um, and that they're not done. We would like to see them monitored by an independent body so that we can trust the results that we are seeing, that they're not being covered up or things aren't happening in quarries that shouldn't be happening with the ear results. Um, so I'm quite happy to see the rates increase, but from that I want to see action. And from that action, we expect to see results. And I'd like to see some funding for some independent people from ECAN to go out and monitor these ear readings and dust readings so that we can have trust and credibility and maybe transparency as well, that we really can with our young people tell them that area is safe. Um, the other thing is our students, um, they know about nitrate levels. They've educated me what nitrate levels are and how concerned we should be. And I, and I value them for that. And that, the other thing that scares me is when they started talking about the research they've done and the cost to fix our um, water if we get it wrong with some nitrate levels. So I value that as well from them. But I think from Hornby, Yorhurst and Templeton, it really is the reading of those our air um, controls that we have and having that safety that we know that they, you know, that it's being done by an independent body. I come from a background where all my testing and my um, the job I'm involved in is done independently. There is absolutely no way that the food safety in New Zealand would let me do my own testing and, and put those results in and say that my food was safe. And I feel it's the same with air, that it should be independently monitored. And I think Rangura and Royston are going to be added to that list. We talk about fertile land, you know, I've heard the last speaker. I come from a background, as I say, with my job. We are struggling to grow vegetables in Pukekohe now with the amount of fertile land. The pressures will come on the farmers down here to produce more and more. So much of our lettuce and broccoli already goes up to the North Island now to accommodate for the losses at Pukekohe. So it's a real big issue. And so, so if we're turning you know, real good land into quarries, I mean, that's got to be another issue with our, our food going forward and our kai that, you know, are we going to have enough for our own people? It was all, sorry to be so short, but I wrote it behind time. Oh, no, that's very good. Thank you for coming in. Have we got some questions um, for Mark? Uh, yeah, Ian. Uh, sure, Mark, thank you for your submission. Um, <clears throat> I see you got written here that uh, you see scrap the free bus plans. Um, that the, you know, the fantasy will wear off, wear off over time. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit more? Okay, so I can only relate this back to a sporting background where we thought the ideal situation to get people to come and watch our sport was to give uh, free entry into the sports. Now, the initial response was that we've got a great increase in the numbers of spectators coming to watch our sports, but over time that fell away. So the novelty of coming to a free event fell away. I think you'd get more encouragement on buses, knowing your bus is going to turn up on time, that it's a bus not smoking out of diesel. I think there are the issues that need to be addressed that we're hearing. Like we uh, on our Facebook page got a lot of feedback from people that are turning up to catch a bus and it's saying that it's going to be there in 30 minutes and yet they've just seen it going down the road, that bus that was coming in 30 minutes. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I just noticed your comments about borrowing and that you, you, you said, yes, provided it's no burden for future generations and it's spent to save costs in the future. So just wonder if you could elaborate on that a wee bit. Do you mean that, in fact, it would could be as long as it's a good investment and it was productive use of borrowing? But it exactly in one. And we had a, a meeting of combined residents and it wasn't so much about um, Environment Canada, it was about the Project City Council and that don't defer doing stuff if it's going to cost us more in the future. The time is right to borrow now if you can save costs in the future. But in the same token, yeah, we don't want to burden 
our future generation by delaying. That's why I support the rates increase action. Well, thank you very much. Um, you were very clear and concise. So thank you for taking the time to come in. We've recently had some um, residents about dust, so that was very timely. Thank you very much. Uh, the next submitter will be Dave Evans. Hi, Dave. Oh, you just need to press your button on there, please. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to speak to my submission on the ECAN LTP. I really appreciate that ECAN has acknowledged the climate and biodiversity emergency put action on the LTP. This transformational opportunity is recognised on, on page seven of the consultation document are all appropriate for addressing the challenges we will experience over the near and long term future. I do feel that so often there is talk about the costs of addressing climate change without at the same time considering the many and varied costs we will experience if we don't pay the price of mitigating our emissions and adapting our infrastructure to cope with what will be thrown at us. The frequency and severity of natural disasters is increasing and the time will come when insurance premiums will become prohibitively expensive or insurance will be impossible to obtain. I'm also very concerned about the declining quality and quantity of our lowland freshwater resources. Management and protection of these resources is ECAN's responsibility, and yet it seems that ECAN is struggling to halt the decline. I would like to think that ECAN is taking every possible action to halt that decline and indeed ensure that the quality and quantity begin to improve all over Canterbury. Therefore, I particularly support the portfolios for protecting and improving our freshwater. Clean water is just as important to human life and welfare as a stable atmosphere and climate, so we need to protect our freshwater supplies. <clears throat> I'm deeply concerned about the ongoing increase in nitrates in groundwater in Canterbury, especially it can take many years for the full extent of the pollution to show up in deeper aquifers and even longer for them to be cleaned up. Following research showing the link between nitrate levels in drinking water and the incidence of bowel cancer in the population, the nationally allowable level for nitrate and water is being decreased over time and ECAN needs to be taking account of upcoming regular route change. I would also like ECAN to, ECAN to explore every possible avenue for allowing possible public consultation on consents that have the potential to affect the pollution of groundwater. Canterbury has the most extensively modified environment in the country and it can be hard to find a native plant in many areas of the plains. Yet our greater rivers are a globally rare physical phenomenon and ecosystem, so I strongly support the Braided River Revival Program. There are also few remaining wetlands on the Canterbury Plains, so as a long-time board member of the Travis Wetland Trust, I also support the full extent of the Priority Habitats Wetland Protection Portfolio. Biodiversity across Canterbury needs protection and restoration, so I support the Maururaco portfolio as well as increasing the capacity of the Enviro School program. Young people need to have a deep understanding and appreciation of the enormous value of our unique natural ecosystems. <coughs> Public transport is a vital part of reducing our transport emissions, and so I support the full extent of the transforming public transport portfolio. I believe children's fears on public transport should be extended to at least 18 year olds and preferably to all tertiary students. To reduce our transport emissions, we should take this as an opportunity to engender the habit, the habit of using public transport. I would also like to see the My Way trial in Timaru continued as ultimately on demand public transport may be a more efficient way of providing service in off peak times and to the outer suburbs of Christchurch City. I would also like to see an investigation of commuter rail transport from Rangiora and Rolleston into Christchurch City. In order to receive the full benefit of the work in the portfolios I've mentioned, mentioned I support adoption of option one for the LTP. It is an increased cost for ratepayers, but I don't think we can afford not to do a lot of the work that is included in option one. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, have we got any questions? Yes, Councillor Lan Farn. Yeah, thanks so much for your submission, Dave. Um, it was really clear. I think the one 
question that I had um, in your comments about affordability is when you said I would be willing to pay more. And did, do you mean, because you've got support for option one in the program, do you mean you'd be willing to pay more in terms of to meet option one? Or do you mean actually more than option one? I suppose I mean particularly to, to meet option one. Anybody else who wanted a question? Oh, Yang, sorry, I missed you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dave, thank you for your submission. Just on the UAGC, um, you're talking about the, um, having a, a median value and then above that it's fixed, right? And then below a sliding scale proportional to the house value. Um, have you seen an example of this anywhere else, or is, is, is this concept you thought about it a lot and you come up with it yourself? Yeah, it's just a half-baked idea of my own, really. It, I, I mean, I can see the reason for having a UAGC that isn't proportional, but um, things that aren't proportional have a, a greater effect on the people with uh, a lower value property. And so the current UAGC, would you see is that the kind of level you'd see fixed now and then proportional going down from there? Or would you see, have you see, do you know another level in your, have you thought about another costing? I probably haven't thought about it that deeply, but I, I wouldn't want to see it increase the way it has been proposed. Um, I suppose if it was increased, but then proportional for low, the lower value properties, then that would make sense. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we've got any other questions for you. So thank you very much, Dave, for taking the time to come in. We do really appreciate it and putting in your submission. So have a good rest of the day. Thank you. OK, the next, the next person is Ro um, Ross Hewlinson. Hewlinson. Thank you, Ross. Um, we'll just have to push that button on that speaker, if you don't mind, on the mic. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, the Greater Hornby Residents Association do support your planned increase in rates. I'll take it as read that you're familiar with their submission, so I'll touch on some points in particular. Climate change is going to affect us all. There's no doubt on this, it's coming, maybe even faster and possibly bigger than we think. So we cannot be seen as resting on our laurels. Recently, Professor James Brassington from the University of Canterbury gave a talk in Glen Orkey on the rise of aggregate in the Dart and Rees rivers. Realised it's a different area, however, it's now predicted that this township is in danger of destruction through floods. The rivers are rising at a rate of 30 centimetres per year. So what we may be facing here in Canterbury is an even more severe river rise as the Waimak, Rakaia and Rangitata have much larger catchment areas. Along with this, we have a very high possible probable loss of productive farmland and residential areas in our immediate area. A two degree temperature increase may see a large area of land below Lincoln disappear, as well as the road to Akira to below sea level. While there's probably little we can do about this, we can at least start to get prepared by looking in depth at what action to take. The Alpine Fault is another scenario with recent news that this is now likely to happen within the next 30 years with about a 75% likelihood. It's been predicted by the University of Canterbury that while it may not be as severe as the recent quakes in Christchurch, it will be longer and there'll be up to four minutes of sustained shaking. Highly likely to bring liquefaction and possibly the sinking of land. When farming on the inland road, we used to receive the Hurunui news. And at that time, it was predicted that land east of the motorway north of Christchurch would could subside. Let us hope this is wrong. It's not as catastrophic to say the least. What we do see is a very high probability, however, there's a complete collapse of inland glaciers and their valleys, bringing down vast quantities of aggregate into the rivers, possibly damming them, causing floods downstream as they let go, 
You'll also see a vast influx of gravels being washed downstream, possibly damaging stock banks or overcome them completely and, and Christchurch severe flooding as a result. Christchurch has continued to be built on previous swamp land, which when ground levels rise, will see these areas become problems. We realise that if developers don't get their way, they're not scared of taking councils to the Environment Court, often successfully. However, if councils band together and rezone the better quality land for residential and industrial, everyone would be better off. Take note of what Professor James Brassington has to say regarding alluvial gravels in our rivers. Take note of the Land Care Research Report dated August 2006, where it states effective regulation monitoring of gravel extraction rates requires systematic collection of measurements of trends in the bed levels. It should be remembered that cross-section surveys of the Canterbury Rivers can be tracked back as, the night, as far as the 1930s. We noted in the paper that ECAN uses XSET as a tool for an analy analysing the bed level monitoring data. However, ECAN undertakes very little interpretation of this data. Analysis has been limited to flood modelling. We believe it's now time to shift gravel extraction away from LC1, 2 and 3 land and move back to the extraction from the rivers. Just to quantify this, I can tell you it can be done. I used to work for a company called Andrews and & Bevins, and one of my divisions in there was mining equipment. After all, this supply is ongoing from the mountains and continually replaced. From 1960 to 2004, only six, eight surveys of the WIMAC were undertaken, approximately six years apart, with an average of 60 cross-sections being undertaken, although there's no data on the length of these cross-sections. LIDAR has also been used, but we have no data on this yet. We may ask for it. There are tables for calculating extraction rates, but if the data is lacking, it's highly unlikely this is even happening. NEWA did undertake some work on the morphology of the WIMAC. However, how much is unknown? ECAN should have all this data somewhere in its archives. And a full investigation should be undertaken into reverting gravel extraction back to naturally occurring samples, our supplies, sorry, such as the rivers and away from the wanton destruction of good pastoral land that used, can be used endlessly and not just for the short time it's happening with gravel pits. Where there are operators going, where are the operators going to be when they become flooded? The simple answer is gone. I have here a copy of the quarry operator's opinions printed last Saturday, right here in the paper, where they claim their operations are more important and profitable than farming or housing. Sure, there'll be a few dairy farmers and farmers around that would disagree with that. This shows the total arrogance of these people and the excessive amounts of money they are making. With 23 to 30 years of secure aggregate, quoted by Pottenhogan at the Royden hearing, there is no reason a moratorium cannot be placed on gravel pits. And the GHRA requests this of you while an investigation is carried out into future supply of Canterbury gravels. I believe have approximately, approximately level 46% crystalline silica content, one of the worst levels in the world while our setback levels rank as one, also one of the worst in the world. We have residents in Western Christchurch suffering from illness directly related to aggregate mining. Bring in a one kilometre setback, the same as India, believe it or not, and similar penalties as Queensland, and this will soon clean up this industry. As we've also mentioned, being a, bring in portable dust monitors and the necessary staff to monitor them as the current system is nothing short of a complete failure. Well, realise that banning trawlers from inshore fishing is a big ask. We ask you to be a leader in this field as a marine dog biodiversity is suffering as a direct result of them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your submission and taking the time to come in. Have we got some questions? Uh, Councillor Clearwater. Water. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Um, you made a, a, start, a statement in your written statement to us that um, a combined residence group association of associations you want, wanted to see their previous yellow bus in the city restored. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering, was there 
I, just, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how, how many of the outside residents would it, would be likely to use it if, if we were to actually reinstate it. This was actually raised at a combined residents association meeting where there were a large a number of residents associations at the Rickerton facility. Um, it wasn't actually us that raised it, it was actually the other residents associations, but it was discussed fully at that meeting by all the residents associations and agreed that that seems to be the way that most of those people want it. They want to see that bus route back reinstated. Other questions are for Ross. Uh, Councillor Megan Hain. Thank you, Ross. Uh, you talked about the Alpine Fault uh, earthquake uh, research that's just come out recently. Just wondered whether or not the association had looked at the increase in the civil defence rate at all and, and whether you thought that was appropriate or more or less or where you were at or whether it was something you haven't haven't talked to with your people. This is something we haven't discussed as yet. Our next meeting is um, next Sunday. Um, and no doubt we can raise that. Um, yes, I believe we do need to look at civil defence. Um, if you go into the Canterbury model, you can actually see the ground movement coming from south north, and it is very sustained. And that was before the last um, finding. Yes. Right. Any further questions? Councillor Hayes. All right, all right. There doesn't seem to be any further, uh, Ross, but I want to thank you very much for coming in. It was excellent and giving us a report from the Residents Association. Good work on behalf of the residents. Thank you very much. I'll just leave this uh, here with Councillor Hens. It's just what I've read today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it off now because I'm supposed to have mine on. So welcome and um, you'll um, need to turn your mic on, but thank you very much for coming. Off you go. Um, thank you and I'm as surprised as anyone to be here. I thought I was actually just going to um, confirm my submission. So um, this is unusual. I only I represent um, my family, myself, seven grandchildren um, as a resident of Canterbury for 30 years and um, an ex-primary teacher. Um, I wanted to support your um, option one and to say why I supported it. So um, I totally believe in um, protecting our aquifers and lakes. I am concerned about the nitrates in the drinking water for my children, my grandchildren. I believe it's something that's going to accelerate and that um, setting the level that we have at the moment isn't sufficient. I'd like to see it following the Danish study um, level, which is 0 0.87 milligrams per litre, um, because I believe we haven't, we won't be seeing the, um, the full effect of dairy farming in Canterbury for years to come. Um, another area that I'm particularly passionate about is the education and the Envira schools, and I would like to see uh, more money spent there. I think the council is probably better informed than the average person on the outcomes that are facing um, us as a result of climate change and therefore you should educate the young people within the school system and as a result their families so that they can behave and make better um, better judgments better vote vote in a better system uh, better systems for their protection uh, and my other passion is the tree planting and the um, regeneration of the natural environment and planting up the waterways and um, as part of the tree planting effort up Evans Pass. I would like to see more um, of a general plan for Canterbury, the Max Peninsula, as opposed to the bits that are done, um, seems to be done piecemeal with a bit of funding here and a bit of funding there. It would be nice to have a general plan that we could um, approach. Um, yeah, that's all really, I think, um, just to support option one. I did also say I didn't like the UAGC, um, which was going to be a flat rate, I believe. I thought that was unfair. And I'd like to see that um, 
put them on the priority rate for bait. But anyway. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and um, presenting. I, I suppose this is the first time you've ever presented like this. So, so isn't that great? A new experience for you. So that's fantastic. So we really appreciate it. I can see Councillor Clearwater is indicating and Councillor Lan Farm. We'll just have a bit of a question for you. Thanks very much. I'm just interested in your comments um, around the flat tax rate. Uh, sorry, rate flat rate rating system, universal and general charge. And you said in one word it was unfair. I just wondering if you might. Ex ex I think that's what you said. So, yes. So I just I'd be interested. Be interested in you just explaining your views about how you see it unfair. Yes. <laughs> My very simple take on that is that a flat charge um, is is unfair on people with lower income who have um, less. I, I believe it should be rated more um, according to income, according to property value, according to the ability to pay it. Yeah, as opposed to a lump sum. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lam. Um, yeah, thanks so much for making the effort, Gillian. It's great to have you. Um, my question is around, um, you talk about climate education funding and your support for that. Um, and you've also talked about biodiversity initiatives and the plantings around Evans Pass, was it? Um, do you think we've got the package about right in terms of balancing the education versus the on-the-ground component? Or, or are you specifically saying you you think the education one should be expanded or are you happy with the balance that we've sort of got in the plan? Oh sorry, just your button to you, sorry. Absolutely not. Um, I'd like to see more schools involved as Envira schools so that children get the message and know that they've got some power um, to make a difference and they also take the message home to their families. Um, so that's what I feel about Envira schools. The planting, that's almost another issue in a way, I believe. So when we do the plantings up at the for example, other areas, the council will have to fund some of the trees, provide some labour, but it's sort of an initiative for that um, yeah, that group. We don't see a long, we don't see a bigger plan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Nicole uh, Marshall. Thank you, Chair. Um, you suggest amending um, one of our levels of service to read, collect, analyse and publish data as opposed to just collect and publish data. Do you have any examples of the sorts of analysis you'd like to see? Uh, so that's page five of this. Unfortunately, I didn't print out my um, um, Level of service three, undertake targeted science research and investigations on matters relevant to policy development with form council and stakeholders. Um, so a proposed performance measure was publish mm. data um, No, I'm reading Carolina. Oh, I'm reading the wrong one. I'm so sorry. But never mind, never mind. That's all sorted. <laughs> never mind. Um, that's very, very good of you to come in and speak on behalf of your family. We really do appreciate it. And uh, we all around the table want to hear from people like you. So it's, it's great. Thank you for coming. All right, bye. Um, now, who are we up to? Roy. Roy. Roy, um, Roy, are you in the room? Yes, there you are. Roy, would you like to come up to the table, please? And if you can just push that mic button, that'd be great. I do not want to be here. I would rather be working on my farm. But coming here is the only opportunity I have to voice my concern over ECAN's proposed 24.5% increase in our rates. It's immoral when inflation is 1.5% and it represents a total abuse of your power. You do it because you can get away with it. And there's not a thing I can do about it. I can't refuse to pay it. So all that's left for me to do is come here and voice my concern. It's not as though it's the first cost imposed on us by ECAN. We've had farm environmental plans, thousands of dollars. Audits of farm environmental plans, more thousands of dollars. I want a license to spray. I have to enrol and do a course with a provider. What do you know? Another thousand dollars. Oh, of course, I have to be audited. 
The auditor I was put in touch with lives in Nelson, a 10-hour round trip away. He charges $250 an hour. That's up front before I get my audit. Can't you see we are sick and tired of these increasing bureaucratic costs? Then you tell us we're going to get a 24.5% rate increase. And Jenny Huey has the gall to tell us we should be pleased with it and we need a change of mindset. Ms Huey, we have siege mentality and your 24.5% is the concrete block that broke the camel's back. And I'm sorry to say that it is you that needs a change of mindset. To get you out of this ivory tower, down to Struggle Street with real people like us, to whom 24.5% rate increase is an immoral, unconscionable, unacceptable abuse of power. You say the environment is a priority, then make it that. This means that everything else is not a priority and it gets pushed back. It doesn't mean you just add more on top. It's not a cost plus game. Do what you are paid to do. Go back and budget. Budgeting means that you match your costs with your income, just not dumping another layer of cost on top. I haven't got your budget, but you certainly have. Go back to your budget with your red pen and identify the projects that you're going to cut and those that you are going to do away with altogether and keep the rates increased down to 5%. That's how simple it is. I see from one of your handouts that you have environmental programs in schools, currently including some of the 80, 90 schools, and that you'd like it to be 120 or so. No, you don't. Nice to have equate to 24.5%. You go back and you cut the program. It's simply not achievable. Ms Huey says that we must think laterally and aspirationally to make a difference to the future. Stop. I don't want that PR rubbish if it equates to 24.5% increase. I want you instead to think practically and fiscally responsibly and show some financial acumen and credibility, because at the moment you have shown neither. The whole lot of you are totally irresponsible and not getting the rate increase within a close proximity to the inflation rate of 1.5%, it is a total dereliction of duty. The whole saga shows a glaring incompetence with the administration of ECAM. Any businessman that tried in a climate of 1.5% inflation to increase his costs by 24.5% would be dismissed on the spot. Democracy is clearly not a magic bullet when it leads to bizarre outcomes like this. Deja vu, bring back the commissioners. Commissioners and administrators that know that budgets are something you work within, not something that you work without. Decisions such as this can only hasten the end of ECAN, as it is currently structured and its demise cannot come soon enough for me. Thank you for your time. I do not expect you to appreciate my comments. Oh, well, would you like to um, stay there? Some people might like to ask some questions. Would you like to do that? Have a comment, a bit more of a comment. We, we really do appreciate you coming in. We do want to hear from residents. Under the Local Government Act, we're required to do this consultation, so it's really good that you took the time to come in. So thank you sincerely for doing that. <laughs> well, congratulations for coming. I really appreciate it. I think this participatory stuff's really good for us, so we need to hear from you. So Councillor Clearwater has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Um, look, I just want to clearly, you're very concerned, and thank you for expressing your concerns. And what you make it quite clear that you expect us as councillors to make reductions and cuts and, and improve the budget. So, my question to you really is how can you help us do that? Like, are there any suggestions that you would make, especially from option two, which is a lower amount, that you believe or is, have good reason to believe that in fact we could and should cut? Yeah. 
I haven't got your budget, but you have it. And you can sit down with your budget and you've got to go back with a red pen and cut out. Pro- you've just got to cut projects, things that should. If this freshwater reform is causing all the costs, other things have got to go. You've got to go back with your red pen and you've got to identify them. Some of them you've got to cut, some of them you've got to stop altogether. You know, we, we've been hit with thousands and thousands of dollars from ECAM with all these farming families, all these, you know, we've met. There's not a farmer I know that doesn't want to be environmentally friendly. But of course, we don't want nitrates in our water either. But we don't want 24% cost increases dumped on us either, especially on top of all those other things. Thanks. Um, Councillor Lan, you Oh, your similar question. Okay, anybody else? All right. Well, look, thank you very much for coming and we really do appreciate it. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, last. The, all right. Um, good afternoon, Kate. Uh, can you hear us? Oh, we can't hear you. We'd better get you to pop your speaker off. There we go. Can you hear me now? Good to see you. Um, can, we can't quite hear you. Um, can you hear me now? I've got my my speaker on. That's better if you lean forward, I think. It seems to be a bit hard to hear people today, so just have another go. Can you hear me now? We can just hear, so if you just keep if speaking come, loud. If I come this close, you can hear yes. me? Yes, okay. that'd okay. be great. Thank you very much. Okay. Well done, everyone. I'm making the getting to the end of the day. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. I just want to talk about, well, you all know what I want to talk about, the Lower Waitaki River issues. Um, I, I support, I actually support the borrowing for reserves for exactly the Lower Waitaki problem that we have here with erosion and the loss of farmers land and if we we're currently after the last flood have been using up all the uh, reserves that we had and so I think we should we need to have reserves to support that sort of thing um, I I hope that we are doing a rating review for the uh, lower way tacky I keep hearing we're doing it, but I'd love some promises today that we are doing it, that it's a more fair rating review, and we would like to be involved in the consent process with Meridian uh, when they uh, apply for their new consenting. We would like to have a voice in that. Um, and in the rating review, uh, it would be good to see less burden on the adjacent landowners and a more fairer system, a more fairer system that uh, all river, all water users out of the Waitaki are rated, not just those of us that are adjacent landowners. Um, I struggle with ECAN's... Uh, Border di- getting rid of border dikes and going for spray. We have lost all our bird corridors in the Waitaki. We, we've lost our kingfishers, we've lost our pukekos. We've, the bird life has definitely gone down since we changed in the CADEC scheme, the Kurao Duntroon Irrigation Scheme from border we took away all the border dikes and we've piped the scheme and now we've so little bird life here. So I want to really reiterate to Environment Canterbury that it's not all about efficient use of water in as in border and spray. Um, there's all the environmental issues that go with it, the loss of wetlands. Um, and I also want to talk about zone, commit, zone committees. I'm not sure if... I know that zone committees for Environment Canterbury are community consultation, but I'm concerned about the level of money that's being used up in zone committees 
and management of zoning committees. I'm wondering, when I started on the zoning committee, when they were first formed, we didn't have all these levels of management that we now have. We have zone leads, we have zone managers. Do we need all these levels of management? Because we've already got all our plans and zoning committees now, and so it's all about implementation now. And we need that. I'd like to see some of that money that goes into management put into on-the-ground workers, especially our zone committee needs a catchment coordinator. We need someone to go around within our catchments and coordinate them at, with what to educate them and to get them involved in what we're all trying to do. But at the moment, I'm feeling like we just are bums on seats at sewing committees. I would like to ask if we could change the funding for e uh, immediate steps funding and use some of that, if we could use some of that to put in a uh, catchment coordinator. And I think um, that's about all I want to talk about. All right. Well, thank you, Kate. We really appreciate your time. We've got a couple of questions for you. First of all, Councillor uh, Scott would like to ask you a question. Great photo, Kate, behind you. Um, great to see the river in such splendour behind you. Kate, I just wonder about um, when we talk about this rating stuff, uh, do you think ORC are on board with the views you've expressed? I don't. Have you spent some time talking to them? Not, uh, not recently. Okay, thanks. Other questions uh, for Kate? All right. Well, it seems like that might be as many questions as we've got for you, Kate. But thanks very much for coming on today and supporting your submission. Uh, we'll be looking at all these and responding and we'll be considering it when we do our deliberations. Um, as people know, I recently visited uh, Kate and I, I saw that picture in uh, real life <laughs> and it's a fantastic photo. It just, look, it just reminds us of what the braided rivers should be like. And um, so thank you very, very much for coming, for coming and speaking to us today. We really do appreciate it. Do you want to say something finally? Thank you. Jenny, um, I, what I would like to say is I'm one step closer to my eco corridor from the Hunter Hills to Lake Wainono as of today and going to meet with the Mayor of the Waimati District Council and hopefully we can uh, fence all that area above the, um, the hook, at the top of the hook. So that'll be good. Which Gordon saw. Oh, yes, it sounds like it's a great idea. So I'm not supposed to say that, I don't think, but anyway. Um, <laughs> there's been lots of great ideas today. So thank you for being part of it and sharing it. We really do appreciate all the work you do. Thanks very much. OK, bye. All right. Um, so I think we're at the end of the day, aren't we? We now have to follow, go back to the... No, no we oh, wait journey. till the end. It's just the journey. Just the next day. Day. Do we need a resolution around no, the journey? No, no. Just, need no journey. just the journey. I'll be back to my hot. So we're adjourning now and we'll be back to um, the meeting. Is it nine o'clock in the morning? I'm not sure. I, I had a bit of a look at those yesterday. There was a, Anyway, it is nine, is it? As long as it's on the heavy ones that got the same time, that'd be good. Well, thank you all very much, and we'll see you in the morning. Okay. Uh, oh, do we want to have a karaoke? Yeah. Oh, kia ora. Tata. Nei rā te mihi ki a koutou. Mō koutou mahi tēnei tēnei rā. Uh, ina mea mō te hāpori. Uh, ai, uh, tēnā koutou mō koutou. Uh, Koero ki a mātou. Uh, ai, e mahi whakarongo nei tēnei tēnei rā. Um, ai, tēnā koutou. So, just acknowledging everybody. All of our submitters, uh, many of them are still there, but also just, just acknowledging them for all the, all the work I've done and their challenges and uh, aspirations to us. And um, yeah, to everyone for listening. So, kia ora. Uh, he karakia, uh, akubutunga o tātou nei rā, uh, kia tau, nga manaki tanga o nga me karo, ki runga ki tēnā ki tēnā o tātou, ko mahia, te hua mā kihi ki, kia toa te reo, kia toa te mana, kia toa te aroha, tūturi whakamaa, kia tēnā, kai mea huie, kai mea huie. Uh, thank you, Craig.